Russia recently lost the biggest tank battle of the entire war in Ukraine. Could it mean the beginning of Putin's defeat? This bloody battle over the small coal mining town of Vuladar was part of the still ongoing struggle over the larger Donbass region. Vuladar lies about 40 miles southeast of the city of Donetsk, near the pre-invasion line which divided Ukraine from the self-declared Donetsk People's Republic. And since the start of the year, Vuladar has become a killing field for Russian armor, with the largest tank battle of the entire war taking place there over the span of three weeks. In that time alone, Russia lost over 130 tanks and armored vehicles, forcing Putin to rely on mass infantry assaults to try and retake the position. This was a serious blow, especially since tank warfare has been heavily mythologized in Russia since World War II and has also become symbolic of the broader conflict in Ukraine. And the Battle of Volodar showed yet again that the Russian military has some massive issues that won't be fixed anytime soon. Vuladar. Even the name itself has got a kind of Lord of the Rings dark and creepy ring to it, and with good reason. Here's why. While Vuladar has been the site of small clashes and shelling since the start of the invasion, the main battle for the town began on January 24, 2023. That night, Russia began launching assaults on Ukrainian positions, which would quickly turn into a devastating three-week siege demonstrating Russian failures. At that point, Ukraine was still waiting for sophisticated Western tanks, like the US Abrams and German Leopard 2, to arrive. Russia's replacement armor showed up earlier, but during its first deployment in Vuladar, it got absolutely decimated. Without superior firepower this time round, Ukrainians were forced to rely once again on strategy and tactics. Much of the three weeks took on the same pattern, pitched tank battles along dirt roads and tree lines, with Russians trying to thrust forward in columns and Ukrainians firing on them from hidden defensive positions. If this sounds familiar, it might be because Russia took the same terrible approach when trying to take Kyiv last year, costing them hundreds of tanks. Clearly, Russian commanders didn't learn much from that catastrophe and made exactly the same mistake this time around, advancing their unprotected tank columns into ambushes. So how did this latest embarrassment for Putin play out? Because the terrain around Vuladar is hard to defend, consisting mostly of flat, open plains and light woods, it is hardly ideal for stopping a major assault. But Ukrainians used the terrain to their advantage and applied doctrines of combined arms warfare, which Russian war planners clearly haven't picked up on. The key to Ukraine's victory in the Battle of Vuladar was enforcing Russia to fight on their terms. This meant limiting the battlefield and forcing Russian troops to attack where Ukraine wanted them to. To do so, the Ukrainian military placed hundreds of tanks and anti-personnel mines in the fields outside of Vuladar. Due to the flat landscape and lack of cover, any Russian minesweepers were immediately targeted with artillery fire. But Ukrainian troops didn't just put mines everywhere. Instead, they left clear corridors between the minefields, only large enough for two or three Russian tanks at a time to roll through. If the tanks moved at all from the cleared path, they risked having their treads blown off, leaving them totally exposed to artillery strikes. But rather than try an alternate approach to get around the mines, Russian commanders made one of the most basic mistakes in all of warfare, attacking exactly where their enemy wanted them to. When Russian commanders ordered their tanks into battle along these unmined paths outside Vuladar, it left them incredibly vulnerable to the same ambushes Ukrainians have employed since the start of the invasion. Hiding in covered positions near the tank columns, Ukrainian hunter-killer teams set up anti-tank missiles on both sides of the kill zone. Without triggering the anti-tank mines, these teams were able to cross the minefields and dig themselves into strategic positions, often hiding in bushes or abandoned buildings. From there they could fire and retreat with little fear of being hit by tank fire. The main tools Ukraine employed for this stage of the ambush were the domestically produced Stugna P and the American-made Javelin, both deadly anti-tank missiles or ATGMs. Sometimes called the Skiff, the Stugna P is a less advanced system, but can still pack a serious punch against unlucky tanks. The Stugna is somewhat clunky, weighing about 60 pounds, and relies on manual guidance, requiring its operator to maintain line of sight on the target while the missile is still in flight. But even with these limitations, the Stugna has shown it can be deadly, with a range of up to 3 miles and tandem high-explosive anti-tank or high-explosive fragmentary warheads 
capable of penetrating modern composite tank armor. The Javelin has proven to be even more successful at obliterating Russian tanks. Manufactured by American defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, the Javelin has an effective range of more than 8,000 feet and employs a fire-and-forget targeting system, allowing its operator to flee to safety after firing. Once in flight, the Javelin's missile locks onto the infrared signature of its target and flies in one of two flight modes, top attack or direct attack. While its direct attack mode is similar to the Stugner, the Javelin's top attack mode has proven to be the most deadly against Russian tanks. In this configuration, the missile travels in a high arc, coming down on the top of the least protected section of the tank, just above its barrel. Like the Stugner, the Javelin also features a tandem warhead charge, using a smaller initial blast to penetrate hundreds of millimeters of armor, while the second charge creates a cone of superplastically deformed metal, which can shred the inside of a tank like paper. Both of these ATGM systems were put to good use outside of Volodar. Among these responsible was Lieutenant Vladislav Bayek, the deputy commander of Ukraine's 1st Mechanized Battalion of the 72nd Brigade, which inflicted much of the damage on Russian armor. Working out of a bunker in Volodar, Lieutenant Bayek used a drone to spot the first column of 15 Russian tanks and armored personnel vehicles. We were ready, he said. We knew something like this would happen. The Russian officers, meanwhile, clearly did not. Lieutenant Bayak waited until the tanks were strung out between the mined fields before ordering a lightning ambush with the command to battle. Stugner and Javelin operators hiding in the tree lines along the fields opened fire, as did hidden artillery positions further from the road, using American M777 and French Caesar howitzers. Each team was assigned a different section of the Russian column to fire on focusing on the front and back vehicles first to create a bottleneck. The result was devastating. Tanks in the column attempted to turn and escape the ambush, only to blow up on the mine-laden shoulder of the road. In turn, each destroyed vehicle made it harder for the rest of the column to escape, with blown-up vehicles forming their own roadblock. At that point, Ukrainian artillery would open fire on the trapped tanks killing the Russians who tried to flee from their trapped vehicles. It ended in obliteration. For three weeks, this pattern repeated itself, with Russia losing more and more tanks and, incredibly, refusing to change tactics. At one point, Russian tanks became so stuck that Ukrainians were even able to call in a strike by a HIMARS rocket system, usually only effective against stationary targets like ammunition depots. Ukraine also made excellent use of its own older tanks as well. Because they couldn't outgun the Russian armor head-on, Ukrainians dug their tanks into hidden defensive positions. Some were concealed with bushes and camouflage netting, while others were actually buried in the soil, leaving only their turrets. While not effective against top-attack munitions, these dug-in defensive positions dramatically increased the survivability of Ukraine's tanks from head-on fire. And because Ukrainians knew exactly where the Russian tank columns would advance, they were able to range the entire approach for their hidden tanks and artillery. This allowed them to make strikes onto predetermined firing points with high levels of accuracy and not waste their limited ammunition. During each ambush, Ukrainian tank crews also used a range of extremely clever tactics to problem-solve and avoid having their positions detected. The tanks couldn't wait with their engines turned on without giving themselves away through thermal signature or engine noise, but needed to stay warm to be quickly fired up for combat. So Ukrainians placed kerosene-burning heaters next to their engines to keep the tanks ready to go on a moment's notice. Similarly, their hidden positions meant that many Ukrainian tank crews did not have a line of sight to their targets, so they improvised by using drone operators to sight in their attacks. This also added an extra level of confusion for the already bewildered Russian forces, as their front lines were pummeled with unseen tank fire. Their own tanks couldn't locate where to return fire, leaving them essentially blind and helpless. If the Russian columns managed to escape the mines, ATGMs, artillery, and hidden tank positions, Ukraine just used drones to shift their firing positions to fleeing troops and vehicles. And for any tanks that actually managed to retreat back through the kill zone, Ukraine had yet another deadly surprise waiting. In one of its recent shipments of military aid, the United States supplied Ukraine with up to 10,000 specially modified 155mm artillery shells, each filled with nine individual anti-tank mines and a magnetic detonator. Known as Remote Anti-Armor Mine Systems, or RAMs, 
These terrifying weapons were used to mop up any surviving Russian tanks. When a fleeing column would exit the rear of the kill zone, another group of hidden Ukrainian gunners opened fire on their rear, once again trapping them with a rain of anti-tank mines. By employing this strategy again and again against Russians who refused to try other approaches, you can see how Ukrainian defenders destroyed over 100 tanks and armored vehicles in a matter of weeks around Volodar. After a few successful ambushes, it also became clear to Ukrainian commanders that the Russians are running out of experienced tank crews and commanders alike. One Russian tank commander captured outside of Volodar turned out to be a medic who had been given a brief crash course and then sent to the front lines. Because successfully operating even an older tank takes several months of specialized training, there was little chance that the former medic would do anything but get himself killed or captured. And this wasn't a one-off, but a repeating pattern, with almost every Russian officer captured near Volodar having little to no experience in battle. And incredibly, the tank crews these officers were commanding appeared to be even greener. Most were made up of recent conscripts who had, at best, a passing familiarity with whatever vehicle they were operating. This astonishing lack of qualified personnel, while far from surprising, is yet another sign that the Russian war effort is falling apart. Russia lost nearly all of its experienced tank crews during the spring of 2022, during the disastrous assault on Kyiv. The limited number who survived those early ambushes were sent back to the east of the country as Putin limited his war effort. But those survivors were once again decimated during the wildly successful Ukrainian counteroffensive last fall. During that period, the most elite of Russia's remaining tank units, the First Guards Tank Army, was nearly destroyed outside the northern city of Liman. This was the best trained and equipped Russian tank force operating in Ukraine and was supposed to easily hold captured territory. Considering that even this elite unit was not up to the task, it's no surprise that the green Russian troops sent to Volodar have fared so badly. This is a sharp contrast with Ukrainian forces, many of whom were green and terrified when they were drafted or volunteered to defend their country last February. Even though many of those defending Volodar were relatively recent recruits, they learned on the go and didn't make the same mistake twice. Most of Ukraine's most experienced tank crews are currently elsewhere in Eastern Europe, learning to operate the advanced Leopard 2 and M1 Abrams tanks. Yet even the relatively untested troops defending Volodar were able to pull off another staggering victory. This is a pretty clear indication that the war has decisively turned in Ukraine's favor, both in terms of equipment and personnel. It's also yet another reminder of just how poor Russian military doctrine and planning is turning out to be, as neither field officers nor top military brass seem able to learn from past mistakes. Part of this difficulty likely comes from the very structure of the Russian military, which is made up of multiple, independently commanded parts. This lack of a unified command structure has plagued Russia for years and appears to be at least part of the reason why new conscripts are not warned against walking into obvious ambushes. Similarly, the seasoned troops which should theoretically be spearheading such an assault appear to be in much worse shape than expected. A recent intelligence report from the UK found that Russia sent another elite unit, the 155th Naval Infantry Brigade, into the fighting around Volodar. This force is supposed to be among the deadliest in Russia and was utilized in the largest battles last year. But the 155th suffered so many losses that even before Volodar, it was on its third personnel restaffing since the start of the war. As a result, this supposedly first-class fighting force is now staffed mostly by fresh recruits. Adding to the dysfunction is the fact that the 155th was apparently not being sent into combat together, but instead broken up into smaller units and integrated with other commands. Rather than the desired effect of boosting other units' battle readiness, the decision simply made the 155th entirely ineffective. It certainly doesn't help that Russia is rapidly running out of precision-guided munitions and other war supplies. As a result, Russian forces were unable to eliminate the Ukrainian artillery and ATGM positions before their assault on Volodar, assuming they could force their way into the town regardless. Another reason behind Russia's repeated failures in Volodar and elsewhere relates to its heavy use of private military contractors, or PMCs. The most notorious of these is the Wagner Group, headed by Putin confidant Yevgeny Prigozhin. Putin's reliance on Wagner and other groups, as well as the rampant corruption in Russia, has led to a scenario where each is directly competing for the spoils of war. Volodar is near two massive coal mines, 
one of the main reasons why Russia has spent so much time and blood trying to take the town. But since its resources would only likely be given to one PMC, there is a strong incentive to fight over spoils. So at Vuladar, the official Russian military, the Wagner Group, and the Patriot PMC, controlled directly by Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu, have all been competing to make the town their own. As a consequence, none of these groups shared information over the potential ambushes, each hoping that the other would take most of the casualties, leaving them free to take over and plunder the town. Controlling the near 70 million tons of coal underneath Vuladar would make either Prigazin or Shoigu far wealthier than they currently are, giving them a billion-dollar reason not to cooperate. Of course, this dynamic isn't great for an effective fighting force and has left Russia at a significant information disadvantage. There's another political dimension to Russia's failure in Vuladar as well. It's clear to pretty much everyone but the Russians that the smart move would have been to move elsewhere and avoid the potential of mines and ambushes. Yet Russian commanders have insisted on bizarre pitched assaults, possibly because of Putin's desperate need for a political win. Anywhere Russian forces have been ground to a halt, the political importance of not appearing to lose a battle has come to outweigh the strategic importance of withdrawing and maneuvering around static defenses. Doing so would be yet another signal of weakness, especially to Putin's most hardline supporters of the invasion. But even so, after the staggering loss at Vuladar, cracks are starting to show. Russian military bloggers of vocally pro-war group have fiercely criticized the endless failed tank assaults. Grey Zone, a telegram channel close to the Wagner Group, posted in early March that relatives of the dead are inclined almost to murder and blood revenge against the general who was in charge at Vuladar. And while the Ukrainian armed forces can be glad of Russia's staggering incompetence, we should never forget the terrible price paid by places like Vuladar. By the end of the Russian assault in February, the town's deputy mayor stated that Vuladar was destroyed, with 100% of the buildings damaged. Of the town's original population of 15,000, less than 500 remain, mostly squatting in ruins and collecting rainwater to drink. While there is no doubt that the battle was a tactical victory for Ukraine, it will also take many, many years before anything can be rebuilt. In any case, it is more than clear that the war's trajectory has changed in Ukraine's favor and that Russia cannot suffer too many more defeats like this one. But what do you think? Was Vuladar a turning point in the war? And will Russia's repeated failures eventually doom Putin's ambitions? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Imagine trying to invade a country without checking your combat vehicle storage to see if you have enough T-14 Armatas to actually pull it off. Sounds crazy, right? Well, that's exactly what Putin seems to have done in the Russian-Ukraine conflict. You've probably heard it before, but we're here to say it again. Russia is running out of tanks, and it's embarrassing. But wait, Russia's military is supposed to be a force not to be reckoned with. How did it come to this? Is Ukraine so skilled at getting rid of these tanks, or is the Russian army somehow failing at utilizing the ones they do have? Sorry, had. Let's find out. Here's where it all started and quickly went from bad to worse. For Russia, of course. In the little more than a year since Putin began his full-scale invasion of Ukraine and it hasn't quite gone as planned, Russian troops failed to take the capital Kyiv, facing extraordinary resistance from Ukrainians as Ukraine began to receive advanced military hardware and support from Western countries, Russian troops were pushed back into the east of the country, becoming stuck in a devastating war of attrition. In both the war's early stages and current state of gridlock, one of the most notable trends are the enormous losses of manpower and equipment suffered by the supposedly superior Russian armed forces. Nowhere are these devastating losses more obvious than Russia's supply of tanks. And trust us, if you're waging war, you don't want to run low on those. While recent years have seen a number of predictions about tanks becoming obsolete, the war in Ukraine has demonstrated that they remain critical to modern land combat, featuring heavily in operations by both sides. Putin has repeatedly thrown huge amounts of armor into the conflict, hoping to overwhelm Ukrainian defensive positions. As a consequence, a February report by the London-based International Institute for Strategic Studies found that the Russian military had lost at least half of all its entire pre-war fleet of tanks in the fighting, a figure which has only grown in the months since. In just a single day of combat during March around the key city of Bakhmut, 
Ukraine destroyed 21 tanks, 23 armored personnel vehicles and 8 artillery systems. And as of early April, experts estimate that Russian tank losses exceed 2,000 vehicles in 14 months, while Ukrainian officials put the figure even higher for reference. True, Ukraine has also taken heavy losses, with Russia recently claiming it has destroyed more than 8,300 of the country's tanks. However, Ukraine has been working to crowdsource reinforcement tanks from the West, while sanctions and international isolation have forced Russia to dig deep into its stockpiles from the days of the Soviet Union. That's pretty desperate. Unable to obtain the high-tech components it needs to build modern tanks like the T-14 Armata, Russia is now relying on hundreds of 60-year-old Soviet T-62s and 70-year-old T-55s. This is particularly embarrassing for Putin, who has flaunted his efforts to modernize Russia's military capabilities, spending billions in an attempt to once more turn the country into a superpower. So how did this cringy story of Russia's armed forces losing tanks by the dozens begin? The losses started during Putin's initial attempts to seize Kyiv. As Russian tanks and troops poured into the country, General Colonel Oleksandr Shirsky, the head of Ukraine's ground forces, determined that the Russian columns would need to advance along two or three major highways to enter Kyiv in their blitzkrieg attack. So Sierski organized two rings of troops to defend the city, one in the outer suburbs and one in the capital, with as much space between them as possible, in order to minimize damage to infrastructure. He also moved Ukrainian artillery and mobile anti-tank units into concealed defensive positions to the north and northwest of Kyiv allowing them to easily target the highways and saving them from Russian airstrikes. This strategy proved to be extremely effective, allowing defenders to destroy many of the slow-moving tanks. But it gets better. There have been reports of entire companies of Russian armor being destroyed in deadly ambushes by Ukrainian hit-and-run teams using anti-tank guided missiles or ATGMs. While relatively simple, ATGMs have proved to be an incredibly effective tool for destroying Russian armor. There are several main varieties of ATGM currently in use by Ukrainian troops. One is the domestically produced Stugna P, an older class of anti-tank weapon also known as the Skiff in its export version. The Stugna P's launcher and missile weigh a combined 60 pounds, making it a relatively large and heavy ATGM. It also relies on operator guidance requiring its operator to keep tracking the target at all times while the missile is in flight. But even with these limitations, videos have flooded the internet of Ukrainians using Stugna P missiles to devastating effect. The Stugna P has a range from 328 feet to 3.1 miles, with a missile flight time of up to 25 seconds, depending on the target's range. It can also carry high-explosive anti-tank or high-explosive fragmentary warheads capable of penetrating modern tank armor. One benefit of the Stugna P is that despite being heavy, it can be mounted on a tripod, covered with camouflage, and piloted remotely on a laptop-like unit from up to 164 feet away. This has allowed the Ukrainian troops operating Stugnas to keep their units safe from retaliation by Russian tanks and artillery. And the system is simple enough for inexperienced operators to quickly become skilled, such as 42-year-old Ukrainian MP-turned-soldier Tetiana Chornovol. Chornovol worked as a Stugna operator during the Battle of Kyiv, where she and others used a number of hidden ATGMs to throw Russian tank columns into chaos. As she described it in an interview, We saw tanks appearing and we literally ran to our position. I ran to my operator's case. I switch it on, and I see tanks on the screen. They just entered within the range of my missile. I took aim and destroyed the first tank. I shot it right at the fuel cells, and the ammunition was detonated. The tank literally flew off the road, and now it is somewhere in the road ditch in the forest. We don't know about you guys, but we're pretty impressed with Tatiana. With hundreds or thousands of stories like this, it isn't hard to see why even Ukraine's domestic ATGM system has proved to be bad news for Russia. Additionally, there are three main Western ATGM systems responsible for the bulk of destruction to Russian tanks. First is the American FMG-148 Javelin, jointly manufactured by defense giants Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. Ukraine has received more than 7,000 Javelins since the start of the invasion. One of the Javelin's biggest strengths is its trajectory, 
as its missile travels in a high arc in order to strike the less armored section of a tank at the top of its turret. Javelins can also penetrate even the toughest tank armor, as they are fitted with two warheads. A primary charge disrupts the anti-missile countermeasures or armor, while a second charge penetrates and detonates inside the tank. However, this also makes javelins expensive at about $200,000 per unit and $78,000 per replacement missile. Cost aside, javelins have become a staple of Ukraine's defense throughout the war so far, even being turned into an inspirational internet meme termed Saint Javelin by Ukrainian-Canadian journalist Christian Boris. Even as the invasion shifted into its current brutal back and forth of artillery barrages and trench warfare, the Javelin has continued to prove invaluable to Ukrainian forces. But Javelins are just the beginning of our How Ukraine is Obliterating Russian Tanks investigation. Also critical has been the Next Generation Light Anti-Tank Weapon, or NLAW, designed and produced by the Swedish company Saab Befors Dynamics. The NLAW is shoulder-mounted, weighs only 28 pounds, has no backblast footprint, and has a firing range of 65 to over 1,950 feet. Like the Javelin, it utilizes fire-and-forget targeting, requiring no target guidance after firing. It also includes two fire modes, Overfly Top Attack, or OTA, where the missile uses magnetic sensors to detonate just above its target, and Direct Attack Mode. The NLAW is also extremely practical, as it uses a non-explosive soft charge when fired, meaning it can be safely launched from indoors or enclosed spaces. While less expensive than the Javelin, the NLAW still runs at a pricey $33,000 per shot, but with their larger arsenal of ATGMs, Ukrainians have also gotten very good at mixing and matching, using each system in the tactical environment and situations where it will be most useful. As Anatoly, a member of the 128th Mountain Assault Brigade, currently fighting near Bakhmut, recently told a reporter, I'm often asked which ATGW is the best, Enlaw or Javelin. I will say from experience that it is best to use them in tandem. Enlaw is excellent at close range, so it is indispensable when combat action takes place in urban areas like cities and villages. And the Javelin is best at a range of 1 to 2.5 kilometers, i.e. in the open field. Similarly, against lighter armored vehicles, Ukrainians will often now use the domestically produced Stugners or Corsars, saving NLAWs for strikes on heavy tanks from concealed, often urban, positions. That's another five starts for Ukraine's fierce weaponry, but we're not done yet. Lastly is the AT-4 anti-tank missile, also produced by Saab Bofors Dynamics, a disposable, recoilless ATGM. The AT-4 fires a single shot at a range of 650 to 1,950 feet. Designed during the Cold War, the AT-4 is also highly modular and can be loaded with a range of different warheads, some of which can penetrate tank armor up to 600 millimeters thick. Perhaps the AT-4's biggest advantage is its low cost. Each can be produced for under $1,500 and even less in Sweden. While there are numerous videos of Ukraine's armed forces using them to destroy multi-million dollar Russian tanks, since the invasion began, Ukrainians have also become more and more adept at using their arsenal of ATGMs, making it incredibly difficult for Russia to make any real headway. ATGMs, NLAWs, and AT4s, oh my! Yes, Putin has been served a number of reasons to reconsider his invasion plans, but Ukraine isn't done providing him with a few more. Here's a terrifying and reliable weapon they've added to the pile. Another critical but often overlooked means by which Ukraine has wreaked havoc on Russian armor is with the use of landmines. Some of these are from the Soviet era, but the US also supplied over 7,000 shells of its remote anti-armor mine system, or RAM, in late 2022. The RAM is a 155mm howitzer shell containing nine anti-tank mines. When the shell is fired over an open area, the tiny mines are scattered across the ground. This means that Ukrainian forces can lay the mines from a distance rather than by hand, without risking fire by Russian artillery. This makes them especially valuable in open spaces, where they can effectively stop an entire tank force. RAM's lethal power was on full display several months later, when Russian armed forces attempted to take the Ukrainian town of Vulodar. 
In mid-February 2023, Russian losses due to the mines were so steep that the British Defense Secretary claimed an entire 1,000-man Russian brigade was effectively annihilated in one day. Reports like this make it easy to see how tank losses have become so enormous. But besides Ukraine's growing supply and talent for using anti-tank weaponry, there is another driving factor behind Russia's loss of more than 2,000 tanks, which has to do with its deeply flawed strategic approach to the conflict. Specifically, with the backbone of Russia's invasion force, the Battalion Tactical Group, or BTG, a combined unit of tanks, infantry and artillery designed for lightning offensive operations. As Russian columns were devastated outside of Kyiv in early 2022, it became apparent that the BTG were not proving nearly as effective as they should have been. Most contained far too many tanks and armored vehicles, with too little infantry support. So when they came under attack by Ukraine's mobile strike teams, there were not enough soldiers to repel the ambush, and Russian tanks were easy targets. This was compounded by Russia's failure to establish air superiority, which meant it was unable to supply close air support for its tank columns, the way the US did in Iraq and Afghanistan. Combined with Russia's myriad issues resupplying its front lines or repairing broken-down vehicles, and you begin to see just how things went so badly so fast for Putin. And because of all the elements above, Russian tank losses have only grown heavier in the following months of the war. During Ukraine's autumn counteroffensive into the Kharkiv region, for instance, Russia was losing as many as 10 battle tanks per day to Ukraine's two, despite the fact that Russian troops were on the defensive. Most of the tanks destroyed were T-80s and T-72s, which began Russia's critical shortage of those systems. During that same period, Ukrainians reportedly captured over 560 vehicles and hundreds of extra ATGMs. Thus, in the grinding stalemate which has followed, Putin has had to rely on older and older equipment, most notably the T-55s and the T-62s. The T-55 is so old, it literally qualifies as antique. The tank's prototype was first completed in 1945 and entered service with the Soviet Army in 1958. But reports indicate that in March of 2023, Russian troops began moving hundreds of them out of the 111th Central Tank Reserve Base in Khabarovsk, where they had been sitting in long-term storage for many decades. A recent photo showing a Russian soldier posing next to a T-55 somewhere in Zaporizhia Oblast seems to confirm their presence on the ground in Ukraine. The photo also indicates that Russia is sending the T-55s to Ukraine without upgrading them, as the tank in the photo appears to have the same infrared optics that were being used in the late 1950s. Similarly, there is no evidence that the T-55s have been reinforced with modern explosive reactive armor and seem to be using the same thin steel body plating as they did during the early Cold War. This may prove to be an especially bad decision, since the T-55s also include the so-called jack-in-the-box floor, which has doomed many of Russia's other Soviet-era tanks. Unlike modern battle tanks such as the German Leopard 2 or US M1 Abrams, which keep their shells away from the crew behind thick armored walls, older Soviet tanks store their ammunition in a carousel-style automatic loader, sitting directly below the main turret and crew. With only thin steel armor, a well-placed enemy shot can ignite the ammunition and easily blow up the tank. As Professor Robert E. Hamilton of the US Army War College put it bluntly, for a Russian crew, if the ammo storage compartment is hit, everyone is dead. He adds that the force of the explosion will instantaneously vaporize anyone unlucky enough to be inside. And that's far from the ancient tank's only weakness. As military journalist David Axe has written, the T-55 is from a generation of armored vehicles before modern optics, autoloaders, and multi-axis stabilization for their main guns, passive infrared optics, and sophisticated computerized fire controls. Essentially, all this makes the T-55 far less accurate and powerful than any other tank on the battlefield today, leaving them as easy targets for Ukrainian ATGMs and artillery. The Soviet T-62 isn't a whole lot better. It also suffers from poor armor and the jack-in-the-box floor, as well as limited range and firepower compared with any modern tank. First introduced in 1961, the T-62 was once considered cutting edge, even into the 1970s. Many are equipped with either a TSH-2B41 
or a TSH SM41U gunner's sight and active thermal sights, which allow a T62 gunner to fire about a mile during the day and about half that at night. This is about half the range of most modern tanks, making the T62 a sitting duck in many situations. In an effort to slightly improve their effective range, Russia has so far pulled more than 800 T-62s from long-term storage and fitted many with 1PN96MT02 analog thermal gunner's sights. These sights are an upgrade from the T-62's original design, but have not been state-of-the-art since the 1970s, and have mostly been long since replaced with digital Sonsa U sights. But since the Sansa U includes advanced French components now unavailable to Russia due to sanctions, they have had to make do with the older analog sites, making them essentially target practice for Ukrainians. Another huge issue with both the T-55 and T-62 is their discrepancy in barrel and ammunition size. Newer tanks such as the T-90, T-80 and even the T-64 being used by the Ukrainians have the same size barrel and can use common shells. By contrast, the barrel of the T-62 is 115mm and the T-55s is 100mm, meaning both that they cannot use modern ammunition and that they have issues destroying heavily armoured targets. Making this worse is the T-55 and T-62's incredibly slow rate of fire, while the crew of a Ukrainian T-64, Leopard 2 or M1 Abrams can fire 10 to 12 rounds a minute a T-55 or T-62 crew is lucky if they can manage three or four. This reality is likely to get an even greater number of Russians killed in direct battles with Ukrainian forces as they become more and more outgunned. At the same time, Russian tank losses and reliance on older hardware has come hand in hand with catastrophic levels of casualties. The country is so far estimated to have lost some 200,000 to 250,000 soldiers. For reference, that is more than the US has lost in every one of its wars since World War II combined. In response, Putin has been forced to enact conscription, augmenting the Russian front lines with untrained conscripts, hardened criminals, and mercenaries. These troops are essentially forced to attack at gunpoint, and thousands have instead opted to mutiny, flee, or surrender to Ukraine once they reach the front lines. These mind-boggling numbers have also affected the Russian military's ability to properly resupply its tank personnel. Many of the 2,000 tanks already lost were destroyed with their crews still inside, leading to a serious shortage of soldiers with actual experience operating tanks, especially the more modern ones. Ukrainian analyst Oleksandr Kovalenko was recently tracking the shipment of more than a dozen restored T-72s, T-80s and T-90s to a Russian unit near Svatova in eastern Ukraine. But when they arrived, Kovalenko noticed that the most interesting thing is that there are no crews in the unit who can operate these tanks. Replacement crews for T-55s and T-62s can be trained in a relatively shorter time frame, as they do not need to be trained to use automatic gun loaders or sophisticated modern fire controls. The downside of this, of course, is that Russia now has extremely green soldiers using what amounts to rusting, obsolete weaponry. Down the road, this will create even more issues, as the crews currently being trained will not be able to effectively operate the more modern tanks, even if Russia is able to start their production. This degradation of manpower and training could prove to be an even bigger issue than Russia's dwindling military supplies, as effective recruiting and training will become harder and harder. Long term, this could spell disaster for the Russian military and perhaps for Putin himself. With no way to replace modern tanks or the crews needed to operate them properly, it may prove impossible for Russia to remain a global or even regional power. The very presence of T-62s and T-55s on the battlefield is an indictment of Russian power and a sure sign that its armed forces are flailing. But what do you think? Will Russia's tank losses be a defining factor in the outcome of the war? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more content from military experts. First tanks and now submarines. Putin can't seem to keep hold of his weapons, with Russia's only aircraft carrier catching fire not once, not twice, but three times since 2018 and his guided missile cruiser the Moskva sinking in 2022, Russia's navy widely considered one of the most powerful in the world, has seen better days. And now, Russia's submarine power is under serious threat. Here's why. 
It's no secret that things haven't been going well for Russia, from crushing sanctions to staggering military casualties. Putin's invasion of Ukraine has backfired in a host of unexpected ways. It has also highlighted profound weaknesses in Russia's military capabilities, exposing them as aging, corrupt, and poorly led. Nowhere is this more true than at sea. Despite statements by former Russian President Dmitry Medvedev back in 2009 that, without a navy, Russia does not have a future as a state, the country's surface fleet remains embarrassingly inept. Former U.S. Navy Admiral James G. Foggo recently noted that it has been allowed to atrophy due to factors like poor maintenance, low funding, and corruption. This trend has been on full display during recent years, with the Russian Navy suffering a number of embarrassing high-profile mishaps. Its only aircraft carrier, the Admiral Kuznetsov, nicknamed the unluckiest ship in the world, has caught fire at least three times since 2018. Earlier this year, Ukrainian intelligence assessed that the ship is in critical condition and not capable of moving under its own power. That's not to mention the sinking of Russia's Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, in April 2022. But now there's an even bigger problem for Putin, one deep below the waves. For all the issues with its surface fleet, Russia's current fleet of 58 submarines have been long considered among the most powerful in the world. This includes 11 nuclear-powered ballistic missile subs, 17 nuclear-powered attack subs, and 9 nuclear-powered cruise missile subs, with several more on the way next year. While they haven't been a factor in Ukraine, they are still considered a critical threat by the US military. However, their power may not last forever. Recent reports suggest that Russia's submarine capabilities are being seriously harmed by the backlash to its invasion, especially through the crippling effect of Western sanctions. So what does that mean for the future of the Russian military? And just how serious of a blow could it be to Putin's war machine? To understand just how critical Putin's submarine problem could be, we first need to take a quick look at some Russian naval history, which, funnily enough, is permeated with continuing and humiliating losses of fleets. But wait, there's a plot twist, and it occurs just after World War II. Russia has had military power at sea in one form or another since 1696, when Peter the Great first established the Imperial Russian Navy. Impressed by his visits to Western Europe, Peter realized that Russia could never be a true great power while remaining landlocked. By 1710, he had over 58 ships in his fleet, and despite some defeats, by Peter's death in 1725, Russia was the dominant sea power in the Baltic. During the reign of Catherine the Great, the empire's ambitions at sea had grown, establishing a new Black Sea fleet and annexing Crimea for the first time in 1783. By the time of her death in 1796, Russia possessed the world's largest navy after Britain. This period was the height of Russia's imperial naval power. As naval historian Robert A. Theobald once put it, to my mind, the death of Catherine marks the high watermark in Russian naval history. From this date to the end of the Imperial Navy, it was on a treadmill working hard, but getting nowhere. This became obvious during the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856, where Russia suffered a stinging defeat to the combined forces of the Ottomans, France, and Britain. The shortcomings of the Imperial Navy were even more obvious by the time of the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War. But it gets worse. In response to Russian expansionism in the Far East, the newly industrialized Japanese military gave Russian Tsar Nicholas II a humiliating defeat at sea. The war marked Japan's emergence as a great power and contributed heavily to the first Russian Revolution of 1905. Following the Second Revolution in 1917, what remained of the old Imperial Navy came under control of the Soviet Union. And while Lenin and Stalin both aimed to rebuild a powerful Soviet Navy, it remained largely inept throughout both world wars and into the early 1950s. As Theobald described it in his well-known 1953 presentation at the US Naval War College, this is the history of a navy which has lost more complete fleets than any other navy in the world. It is the history of a navy which has never been more than second rate, that has never been decisive in world history, and that has never developed a depth of tradition to compare with those of the Western navies. But this would change drastically only a few years after his assessment, mainly due to one factor – modern submarines. While Russia had some early submarines before World War II, the first modern Soviet ballistic missile submarines were completed in the late 1950s. These early Soviet models were diesel-electric, 
and based on designs pioneered by the Germans, similar to the United States. However, by 1960, the Soviet Navy had launched its first nuclear-powered attack submarines, giving the USSR below-surface capabilities greater than perhaps any country except the US. Soon after, the Soviets also developed nuclear SSGN-class subs, running on nuclear power but designed to launch limited ballistic missile strikes against American aircraft carriers and other naval deployments. Over the next three decades, the Soviet Navy continued to build and maintain a large fleet of submarines, relying on them heavily to challenge America's greater military strength during the Cold War. Because the true names of Soviet subs were rarely known abroad, most are still referred to by NATO codenames, such as the Alpha-class nuclear subs. These use liquid metal-cooled reactor propulsion systems and titanium hulls, enabling them to move extremely fast, over 43 knots, or 80 kilometers an hour, at an operational depth of 2,000 feet, or 600 meters. Also important to Soviet deterrence and power projection were the Typhoon-class subs. The largest submarines ever built, Typhoons are over 563 feet, or 172 meters long, have a beam of 81 feet, or 25 meters, and can carry up to 20 sturgeon nuclear-capable ballistic missiles. These were just a few of the many varieties of subs developed by the Soviet Navy, and the Soviets also continued heavily building diesel-electric models as well, such as the Kilo-class attack subs and others. The fleet was never able to make the switch to fully nuclear-powered, largely due to budgetary and technological constraints. However, by its peak in 1980, the USSR's submarine force had 480 boats, including 71 fast attack and 94 cruise and ballistic missile submarines. Even following the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, this submarine fleet remained a major part of Russia's naval power. Dmitry Gorenberg of the Center for Naval Analyses has noted that during the post-Cold War period, Putin has focused on developing new submarine capabilities, while Russia has essentially lost the ability to construct new, advanced surface vessels. The most advanced of these submarine developments are the Yasin and updated Yasin M-class SSGNs. Developed in the 1990s and early 2000s, Rand Corporation researcher Edward Geist has described these as the crown jewel of the contemporary Russian Navy and perhaps the pinnacle of present-day Russian military technology. And according to Admiral Fogo, one major advantage of the Yasin-class vessels is that they are very quiet, which is the most important thing in submarine warfare. They can also carry both Sircon hypersonic and long-range caliber cruise missiles. Yet these deadly subs also come with a hefty price tag. The Severa Davinsk, the first Yasin-class model, reportedly cost over $1.6 billion. While this is still much cheaper than the US's most advanced subs, it is a very high price tag considering Russia's far smaller economy. In the past few years, Putin's government has also claimed that even more nuclear subs are in the works, including what Russian state media claim to be a new division of submarines carrying nuclear-capable super torpedoes in the coming years. Nick Childs, senior fellow for naval forces and maritime security at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, has argued that investments in submarines up to this point are one of the only things which has allowed Russia to maintain its status among the leading powers. While its fleet is still far smaller than during the Soviet era, Childs points out that it remains very capable and along with some of the older submarines would still pose a threat to NATO, both at sea and against land-based targets. But even before the war in Ukraine, there were some doubts about the true effectiveness of Russia's impressive-seeming subs. While they are doubtless in better shape than its surface fleet, they have never been truly tested in combat. So how are Putin's submarine fleets faring in the Russo-Ukraine conflict? On land, the reckless nature of Russian military doctrine has been on full display in the invasion of Ukraine. But despite the enormous losses by Russia's ground forces, its navy has so far played a very limited role in the conflict. This includes its submarines, which have remained mostly as a nuclear deterrent and threat. The exception to this is Russia's Black Sea Fleet, where submarines off the coast of Sevastopol and Novorossiysk have been used to fire caliber missiles into Ukraine. None of these subs have so far been damaged or destroyed, and there are still concerns that they could be used to counter NATO activity and control trade routes in the Black Sea. But the consequences of Putin's invasion have created a different kind of problem for the Russian Navy and its submarines. 
The crushing regime of Western sanctions imposed on Russia has begun to erode the country's ability to resupply and maintain its military industry. And in December of 2022, the US State Department added even more sanctions directly targeting Russia's naval power. These have already begun to work, cutting Russia off from the technology required in modern subs. As Admiral Foggo told Newsweek in an interview, I think they have been severely crippled by these economic sanctions and by their own foolishness in the war in Ukraine. In particular, the maintenance of existing subs and development of new ones will become increasingly difficult since, when they don't have the raw materials, they can't sustain the industrial base. They don't have the manpower, because that manpower is going into fighting the war in Ukraine. Military losses and brain drain make it likely that Russia will lose its ability to compete with Western countries in submarine development, especially when it comes to their ability to project power. Graham P. Hurd of the George C. Marshall European Center for Security Studies argues that the protracted nature of the conflict and the coming Ukrainian counteroffensive undercuts Russian military credibility. The repeated military failures in Ukraine have created growing pressure in Russia to project an image of strength through its submarines. In turn, this has incentivized the Russian Navy to take greater risks by using submarines which are not seaworthy and fast-tracking new weapon systems without proper testing. Heard added that submarines are the most expensive ticket item in Russia's military budget and have no obvious utility in this war, so Russia compensates and projects power through acceptance of greater risk. As a consequence, Russia's submarines will suffer indirect and long-term damage the longer the war lasts. Similarly, Heard and other experts have pointed out that the sanctions illustrate just how much of Russia's military-industrial complex was, and remains, reliant on critical Western technology. Without the advanced components for submarines manufactured in the US, UK, France, Germany and elsewhere, Russian development will be seriously stunted in the years to come and there are almost no alternatives to the technology which sanctions have cut Russia off from. Parts from China and Iran, for example, are not advanced enough to meet Moscow's requirements. While experts remain divided on just how dependent Russia's nuclear submarines are on Western tech, it's pretty clear that at least some of the imported components are necessary to build new vessels. These are mostly thought to be technologically advanced electronic components for guidance, communication and missile deployment. Russian defense journalist Alexander Timokhin wrote in January that the sanctions imposed on Russia after the special military operation left a sharp imprint on the country's technological capabilities. The production of radar complexes, communication systems, guided missiles, sonar equipment, and other similar systems has proved to be difficult. As a consequence, these restrictions could make it nearly impossible to build Yasin and Yasin M-class subs and other highly capable boats. Childs from the International Institute for Strategic Studies points out that this trajectory is already visible, as while the newest Russian submarines are very capable, Russia's inefficient shipbuilding industry has struggled to deliver them on time and in significant numbers. Like other experts, he agrees that Russia's construction shortfalls will accelerate in the coming months and years, since this could well be exacerbated by the increased demands on other sectors of the defense industry as a result of the war as well as from the impact of sanctions on certain key components. So what do these deficiencies mean for Putin's ambitions and the future of the Russian military? Well, experts have outlined two main possible scenarios for the future of Russia's submarine fleet. One possibility is that as military resource constraints continue to grow, it will lead to prioritization of the elements which have been most impacted, especially ground forces. As of May 2023, Russia has lost nearly 200,000 soldiers a truly staggering figure for a modern military. In turn, as one analyst put it, that will inevitably lead to cuts, or limits at least, in shipbuilding in the future. The other possibility is that Russia will be forced to funnel more investment into submarines due to their relative importance and strategic value. This will mean less and less resources for replenishing ground troops and equipment, which are both cheaper and more expendable. But even if Putin opts for the second scenario, any money spent now is likely to have a delayed impact. Past investments in submarine development and maintenance will carry the Russian fleet for at least a few more years to come, but within five to ten years, it could be a very different picture. Just based on the size and current capabilities of Russian submarines, 
it will likely remain one of the world's most powerful fleets for the next decade. But after that, things are far more uncertain. Any modern submarine which breaks down in the years could become essentially useless, reduced to just so much expensive scrap metal. However Putin attempts to manage his growing economic constraints, the main role of Russian submarines will probably remain as a nuclear deterrent. And there are also some indications that Putin has already realized just how spread thin his resources really are. In March, Russia's Pacific fleet underwent a series of military drills which were described as a surprise inspection of more than a dozen submarines, potentially signaling a lack of faith by the Kremlin in the readiness or maintenance of the fleet. Readouts from the Kremlin show that Putin recently told Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu that while Russia's priorities remain the war in Ukraine, still, the objective to develop the Navy, including in the Pacific theater of operations, remains relevant. Adding that, it is clear that some of the fleet's assets can be used in conflicts elsewhere. This indicates both that Putin does not believe submarines can make much of a difference in Ukraine, and that they remain most useful as a nuclear deterrent. As Russia's submarines begin to break down in the coming years, with no easy way to maintain them or build new state-of-the-art models, the country will also become less able to project power in this way. This will almost certainly happen, regardless of where the Kremlin prioritizes resources, especially since casualties in Ukraine show no sign of slowing down. As losses climb higher and higher, and as sanctions continue their squeeze, it may also provoke Putin into even more aggressive and reckless strategies. In fact, there is evidence that this is already taking place. In the past few months, Russia has deployed submarines in increasingly threatening positions. As Michael Peterson, the director of the Russia Maritime Studies Institute, told Newsweek, we have indications that nuclear-powered submarines have been deploying off the coast of the United States and into the Mediterranean and elsewhere along Europe periphery in ways that mirror Soviet-style submarine deployments in the Cold War. Such aggressive posturing is likely tied to Putin's growing issues in an attempt to project a facade of Russia as a true global power, despite an economy less than half the size of California. This weakness is also reflected in overly optimistic predictions for its military-industrial complex. A recent analysis by the Institute for the Study of War ISW, concluded, similarly to other experts, that Russian officials continue to claim that Russian defense manufacturers are increasing production amidst ongoing indications that the Russian Defense Industrial Base DIB, is unable to meet Russia's long-term economic and military goals. There have been rosy claims by officials like Alexei Rachmanov, head of the Russian United Shipbuilding Company, that submarine production time will soon be cut by 8 to 13 months. But there is little evidence to support this. And in another sign of growing weakness, Putin signed a decree on February the 27th, reducing previous plans to construct at least three nuclear reactor-equipped LIDAR-class icebreakers by 2035 down to just a single vessel. Again, this likely reflects the fact that the need to replenish the stocks of conventional ground weaponry lost in Ukraine will likely consume the majority of Russia's DIB and limit Russia's ability to produce systems aimed at longer-term strategic goals. This includes both nuclear icebreakers and submarines, indicating that Russia's resources are spread much thinner than Putin would like the world to believe. So, to sum up, despite the claims by the Kremlin, there are strong signs that Russia's disastrous strategy in Ukraine has backfired even more than we know. The squeeze of Western sanctions now threatens to render even the deadly Russian submarine fleet obsolete. The longer the war goes on and the more isolated Russia becomes, the harder it will be to obtain the advanced components needed for these vessels. This will continue to erode the country's industrial base, possibly crippling all long-term defense production. And because Russian losses in Ukraine are so heavy, Putin also faces a crisis of credibility and growing pressure to project a facade of power. This has already led to reckless, aggressive posturing by Russian subs and a willingness to use vessels which are not even seaworthy, a problem which seems likely to increase because the Russian Navy has historically been so reliant on them to project power, there is little question that the stagnation of its submarine fleet will be a serious blow in the coming years. But what do you think? Will sanctions and battlefield losses eventually doom Russia's submarine fleet? Or can Putin find a way around these issues and keep Russia as a great power? Let us know what you think in the comments section below. And don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. When you're trying to conquer one of the largest areas in Eastern Europe, 
a little over 233,000 square miles to be exact, which is roughly the size of Texas, and you're running low on tanks, trucks, artillery pieces, aerial drones, and trained military personnel, you can be pretty sure you're failing miserably. Add an increasingly evaporating number of military aircraft to the equation, and it's time to hit the panic button. Be it land or sky, Putin just can't seem to hold on to his weapons. And it's not just embarrassing, it's downright self-destructive. In the case of aerial warfare, it is disastrous. For Russia, of course. Here's the thing. Air power should have been Putin's biggest advantage in Ukraine. When Putin's invasion began in February of 2022, experts and analysts were seriously gloomy about the smaller country's ability to defend its airspace. Most assumed that Russia's much-vaunted air force, the VKS, would be able to quickly overwhelm Ukrainian air defenses and gain a decisive early advantage in the conflict. Even the most optimistic assessments assumed that Russia's air campaign would destroy Ukrainian jets on their bases, while using large-scale ballistic and cruise missile strikes to blind the country's surface-to-air missile radars. This would have forced Ukraine to move its SAM systems away from the front lines, leaving it at a severe early disadvantage and increasingly vulnerable to Russian sorties. But these predictions, often from top conflict analysts, proved to be completely wrong. In more than a year of war, Russia has utterly failed to establish air superiority, while managing to lose staggering quantities of its jets and other assets. In fact, the situation is so bad that earlier this month, one pro-Russian blogger on Telegram, usually cheerleaders for the invasion, stated that the country's air force has engaged in complete idiocy and is detached from reality. Definitely not a good look for Putin. So how has this colossal embarrassment happened? As usual, there's no single answer here. But like other aspects of Russia's failure in Ukraine, it has a lot to do with the long-term issues plaguing the country's military. Corruption, bad strategies, poor training, and more. These certainly aren't new issues, but the war in Ukraine has exposed how much they've come to affect Russian capabilities. To get a better picture of how this has happened, let's start with a super quick look back at both fighter jets and air defense systems from the starting point of the most exciting eras in aircraft development the Jet Age. The so-called Jet Age kicked off in the late 1940s, spurred by profound changes in the field of aeronautics. The jets developed during this period could fly faster, higher, and farther than older piston-powered aircraft. This would soon come to transform the aviation industry in both its commercial and military forms. By using the technology of jet propulsion, many pilots believed they could outrun their enemies in the skies and theoretically create total air superiority. Using jet propulsion, aircraft could vastly increase their speed, a major reason why aircraft-mounted guns were mostly replaced by missiles. By far the most reliable way to shoot a supersonic jet out of the sky. Still the go-to weapon for aerial combat today, aerial missiles also revolutionized the nature of air defenses. Today they rely almost entirely on surface-to-air missiles, or SAMs, to prevent hostile attacks from the sky. And from the 1970s onwards, it also became possible for infantry troops to take down aircraft with their own portable handheld anti-aircraft missiles. These man-portable air defense systems, or man pads, are highly cost-effective shoulder-fired rockets able to lock onto aircraft using infrared homing. They are also easy to use, able to be taught to new recruits in a matter of minutes or hours. And since the start of last year, Ukrainians have shown the world just how valuable man pads can be. As Putin's invasion began, Western nations assumed the Russian Air Force would be among the most significant challenges for Ukrainian defenders. When Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov visited Washington in November 2021 to press for weapons, he reportedly told American officials, we have to prepare now. Point number one is air defense. So NATO members sent thousands of man pads into Ukraine to shore up the country's surface-to-air capabilities. Among others, these weapon transfers have included American-made Stingers, high-velocity British Star Streak missiles, and even surplus Soviet EGLOS systems. And this decision really paid off. These comparatively cheap air defenses managed to stop Russia from obtaining air superiority by imposing asymmetrical costs on any Russian pilot dumb enough to enter Ukrainian airspace. For example, using one 60 to 80,000 EGLA missile, Ukrainian soldiers have been able to down a $36 million Su-34 bomber or an $85 million Sukhoi Su-35S fighter jet. This huge cost differential has had effects across the battle space in Ukraine. Because modern combined arms warfare is highly dependent on air support, Russia's failure to dominate the skies has had serious repercussions. 
the inability to provide sufficient air cover for its tanks, infantry, artillery, or supply lines is one of the reasons Russian forces have taken such devastating losses. Caught in the open, these troops have been falling prey to a range of Ukrainian ambushes from hidden positions on the ground. But does the failure by Russia to achieve air superiority mean a lack of Russian aircraft? Kind of, but not exactly. Ukrainian troops near the front lines around Bakhmut have told reporters that Russia continues to fly daily sorties in hopes of catching their targets unaware. Most of these flyovers last only moments. Russian fighter jets or bombers, often flying in groups of four, fly at low altitude over a target area before quickly dropping or firing their payloads and hightailing it back to their bases. Less maneuverable attack helicopters will also fly right up to the line of combat before firing their missile salvos and quickly fleeing to safety. Another reason for this is the recent addition of the powerful Slovakian S-300 missile defense system to Ukraine's arsenal. This longer-range surface-to-air missile can target Russian jets at higher altitudes, forcing them to fly lower to screen themselves from attack. And in turn, the lower-altitude flights have made them extremely vulnerable to shoulder-mounted missile systems. Because of the medium-range S-300s and shorter-range threat posed by Ukrainian manpads, no Russian air assets are able to spend extended periods of time near the front. Despite the obvious difficulty of shooting down even a low-flying aircraft, the Ukrainian strategy seems to be working pretty well. One report from mid-May 2023 suggested that Ukraine had downed four aircraft in a single day of fighting. While Ukrainian commanders would not confirm their role in the attack, the country's defense ministry stated that the Russian craft ran into some trouble. Numbers like this highlight the focused and effective use of manpads, with soldiers using constant vigilance around the clock to exploit the tiny 3-5 second firing window. Ukraine's surprising ability to contest its airspace was also partly what allowed it to go on the offensive late last year. Some of this was done with Turkish-made Bayraktar drones, which were used to destroy high-value targets like Russian surface-to-air missiles. This strategy, one that Russia has failed in executing itself, allowed Ukraine to launch more attacks from the air without fear of being shot down. Ukraine also used what limited air power it had in some very creative ways. During the sinking of the Russian Black Sea flagship, the Moskva, Ukraine used a drone to distract the ship's anti-air capabilities before launching a salvo of Neptune anti-ship missiles before the unlucky crew could react. Other tactics have included dispersing aircraft and air defense units out of major airfields, vacating certain air defense positions before they could take any losses from Russian fire, and operating their air defense SAM batteries as pop-up units, rather than large batteries with support vehicles. This final tactic proved to be extremely valuable, stopping Russian forces from effectively targeting most of Ukraine's air defenses. While we now take for granted that Ukrainian soldiers will find creative and deadly ways to use its lesser capabilities, it is still no small feat. In fact, the creative use of air power highlights that Ukraine may now have a better understanding of air operations than even many NATO countries. David A. Deptula, a retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant General, has argued that the West can actually learn from Ukraine here. We've become so dominant in the air that we've never had to think through how we would use air power if we were the inferior force, he said. Ukraine is posing us some very interesting questions that we should seriously consider if only to understand how a clever opponent would take us on. Russia, on the other hand, has continually failed to learn from their abysmal performance in the skies. And as with so much else, Russia's systemic failure to establish air superiority also points to the larger issues within the country's military. This became noticeable early on in Ukraine, when rather than overwhelming force, only one or two aircraft at a time conducted strikes against targets in and around Ukrainian cities close to the borders, including Kyiv, Kharkiv, Sumy, Chernihiv, and Mariupol. And when pilots missed their targets, they very rarely mounted follow-up strikes. At that same time, Russian military planners apparently made no plans for large-scale bombardments of air defenses themselves. In fact, they have seemed entirely unable to coordinate the large, complex formations necessary for fighter jets and helicopters to cover each other from enemy fire. More than almost anything else, this helps explain Russia's baffling inability to establish control over the skies despite its qualitative and quantitative advantages. Western air forces have long taken for granted the ability to coordinate the timing and positioning of their attacks in campaigns like the Balkans, Iraq, or Libya. However, the level of planning, logistical, and command and control capacity needed for such air campaigns is massive. Every pilot needs to coordinate and understand their role in the broader operation, including the exact timing and route needed to strike multiple targets. Tanker support is also critical 
to ensure refueling can take place at established rendezvous points. The complexity only increases once actual combat begins, as various fighters tasked with destroying air defenses, those engaging enemy aircraft, bombers, electronic warfare escorts, and search and rescue teams must all work seamlessly together and adapt at a moment's notice. Russia has failed on basically all of these fronts. Many Russian pilots are trained to fly exclusively in pairs or fours, with little exposure to larger maneuvers or formations. They also get far fewer flying hours than NATO crews, do not have tanker support for most operations, and are not trained in large-scale aerial combat doctrine. Lacking all these elements, it's no wonder that Russia could not carry out a Western-style air war against Ukraine. And even in the instances where the Russian Air Force scored victories against Ukrainian positions, they were unable to capitalize on those strikes due to fear of man pads and larger surface-to-air missile systems. When Russia refocused its troops in the Donbass region during April of 2022, they were able to gain some localized air superiority near the new front lines, mainly through the use of artillery strikes against Ukrainian SAMs. But even when they were actually able to gain this limited control of the skies, Russia utterly failed to turn it into any type of concrete battlefield advantage. As one analyst from the London-based Royal United Services Institute or RUSI put it, the primary reason for this is that despite having more than 300 modern fast jets with theoretically flexible capabilities to carry a range of air-to-air -air and air-to-ground munitions, most Russian aircrew have very limited opportunities to drop precision-guided munitions in realistic training scenarios. Another major factor is actually hitting their targets, as many of Russia's jets do not have targeting pods, a standard feature on most Western military aircraft. In fact, while Russia's Su-34 fleet of jets have forward targeting systems and can use precision-guided munitions, they're just about the only ones. The rest of Russia's fighter jets have very limited capability to identify and destroy any battlefield targets which do not show up on radar. This means they've pretty much been limited to attacking fixed targets with satellite or TV-guided weapons or dropping unguided bombs and rockets at predetermined coordinates. One observer noted they are literally cratering empty fields, while an anonymous official from the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency told reporters early this year that under half of all Russian missiles are hitting their aim point. We're holding Russian missile success at just below 40%. In Donbass, this incredibly poor performance has meant Russian jets cannot effectively support ground operations, leaving troops open to a range of ambushes and other tactics. But how did the Russian Air Force end up in such a sad state, especially when Putin ordered a modernization of the fleet just a decade ago? The answer, as with so many things in Russia, seems to be a product of the country's structural issues. While the modernization was supposedly intended to make modern combined force operations easier, it appears to have been mostly for show. One part of this has been inefficiency and widespread corruption. For example, in 2012, one Russian arms company received nearly $26 million to develop an aircraft system for intercepting non-strategic missiles. But the research never actually happened. The company signed the fraudulent contracts with shell companies, the addresses of which were registered to the addresses of public toilets in the Russian city of Samara. In another case from 2016, one company responsible for supplying radio navigation equipment and control systems for guided munitions had a similar scandal. Its top leadership were caught in an embezzlement scheme where they faked research and development techniques in order to steal millions through fraudulent contracts. This type of corruption is common and widespread, also reaching beyond Russia's military-industrial complex and into the top levels of its political elite. So much personal wealth is on the line that some experts argue it has completely changed the incentive structure for Putin's top officials. Most of these individuals own property far beyond their official levels of income, signaling a range of corrupt deals. In turn, these security officials have less incentive to give actual expert advice, which could disappoint Putin and lose them access to their sweet kickbacks. And as mentioned before, poor training and an inflexible command structure compounds these issues. As Phillips O'Brien, professor of strategic studies at University of St. Andrews, has written, though much was made of the flashy new equipment, such as the much-hyped Su-34 strike aircraft, the Russian Air Force continues to suffer from flawed logistics operations and the lack of regular realistic training. Above all, the autocratic Russian kleptocracy does not trust low-ranking and middle-ranking officers and so cannot allow the imaginative, flexible decision-making that NATO air forces rely upon. So, when Russian pilots actually have a chance to act flexibly and change their attacks to hit something, 
bad commanders and rigid doctrine do not allow them to improvise. Instead, they have to try to pull off their standing orders, even if those are likely to fail or lead to their untimely demise from Ukrainian air defenses. It really doesn't look like the situation will get better for the Russian Air Force either. The VKS has shown no sign of changing tactics and seems very hesitant to even use its best jets in the field. This might be because Western sanctions have hit the Russian aerospace industry particularly hard, quickly eroding Russia's ability to obtain the components needed to produce new advanced fighter jets. This became evident in a January call where Putin publicly attacked Denis Mantharov, Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Trade and Industry. Previously a favorite of Putin, Mantarov was humiliated when he explained that the country was unable to obtain the contracts needed for new parts. One Moscow-based defense analyst even told reporters that you have to ask yourself if Mantarov is going to be the next one of Putin's cronies you read about mysteriously falling out of a window somewhere. But the corruption, sanctions, and mounting losses of aircraft in Ukraine seem to have made actually getting the parts an impossible task. This is pretty obvious when we take a look at Russia's three production facilities for Sukhoi aircraft. Despite their massive size, analysis from last year shows that they only produced 31 aircraft during 2022, falling far short of the orders placed in state defense contracts. Essentially, as Rand Corporation analyst John V. Paracini recently put it, Russia's aerospace sector isn't likely to have aircraft to sell, even if it wants to. At the end of March 2023, Ukraine's Armed Forces General Staff claimed at least 305 aircraft had been destroyed since the start of the war. While Russia has reportedly even resorted to stripping the microchips from household appliances to replace its losses, it isn't nearly enough. One Ukrainian defense executive stated that production for some of the most critical subsystems for Russian fighters has almost seized up. Problematic items like the Su-35's Irbis Passive Electronically Scanning Array radar antenna can require a year or more, and that is in times of no embargoes, no supply disruptions. These problems are even greater for Russia's fleet of bombers, such as the Tupolev 295 and 222M3. While Russia has maintained some domestic production capacity for its fighter jets over the years, mainly due to demand from abroad, this isn't the case for bombers. Once the current fleet begins to break down, there is literally no way for Russia to replace them. This is one of the main reasons why many analysts and experts now call Russia's equipment losses in this area irreversible with no chance of restoring stockpiles to pre-war levels. The situation for Russia's air force is also likely to get worse once Ukraine begins receiving the Western F-16s. Retired U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Dan Hampton stated in a recent interview that compared to an F-16, the Russian Su-35 is essentially junk, adding that our planes are more durable. I wouldn't bet in combat on the Su-35 or any Russian-made aircraft. F-16s are versatile, multi-role combat aircraft which come in one- and two-seater models. Since 1979, the F-16 has been continuously upgraded, giving the newer models advanced radar and other capabilities. With a top speed of 1,500 miles per hour, a 33-foot wingspan, and 50-foot length, Hampton points out that the F-16 is very hard to see because it's smaller than most aircraft, especially when it's aimed directly at you. Each also has one M61A1 20mm multi-barrel cannon and can carry six air-to-air -air missiles. While this payload can pack a serious punch, the Russian planes should also be deadly, if used correctly. The Su-35 is a twin-engine, single-seat fighter jet, which the Rand Corporation has called Russia's signature heavy fighter bomber. While the Su-35 is reportedly faster than the F-16, able to reach Mach 2, it does not have the same powerful active electronically scanned array radar, making it a more vulnerable and obvious target. Colonel Hampton has pointed out that the Su-35 is easy to use, easy to pick up on radar, and easy to shoot at with a long-range missile. Part of this is because it's such a large plane, with a 50-foot wingspan and a length of nearly 70 feet. And as Hampton stated, the Su-35 is a typical Russian machine and looks good, but deep down it's not really that good of a plane. But which jet is actually superior? Well, it really might come down to who is using it. As David Jordan, co-director of the Freeman Air and Space Institute at King's College London pointed out, that on paper, it can be argued that the Su-35 has an edge over the sorts of F-16s the Ukrainians are likely to get, but that doesn't tell the whole story. Like anything else, the effectiveness of each jet will depend largely on its pilot, their training, and the tactics they employ. Seeing as Ukrainians have already held their own so effectively, there is reason to believe this won't change soon. 
Combined with their use of man pads, Jordan has argued that I would suspect that the F-16s in Ukrainian hands will represent a formidable challenge. Other experts suggest that the context in which a battle occurs will determine how well the F-16s stack up to the Su-35. Retired British Royal Air Force Commodore Andrew Curtis told Newsweek that if it comes to dogfighting, the F-16 is still one of the best in the world. However, the Russian pilots are likely to try and fight a standoff battle using medium and long-range missiles. If they can do this successfully, that may tilt the balance in the Su-35's favor. But regardless, it seems unlikely that Russia will be able to achieve more than the brief localized air superiority it held last year. Since Ukraine's capabilities are only growing, with more and more Western support, there is little chance of Russia making any real gains. With Russia hemmed in by man pads and other surface-to-air systems, and unable to replace or make more of their advanced jets, it seems only a matter of time before Ukraine starts to retake the airspace in its east. So, to sum things up, it has truly been a terrible year for the VKS. The war in Ukraine has exposed its fundamental weaknesses, while sanctions and enormous losses have seriously harmed its future outlook. Unable to even use the advanced jets it currently has correctly, Russia's air force is not likely to see any improvement soon. Ukraine, on the other hand, has been able to adapt and use superior tactics to overcome its numerical weaknesses. Once the Ukrainian Air Force gets its hands on some F-16s, the tide of war may turn even faster. But what do you think? Why has Russia's Air Force been failing so badly? And will Ukraine continue to hold its own in the skies? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content. Russia has a massive drone problem. In the last few months, dozens of drone strikes and mysterious explosions inside Russian territory suggest that Ukraine is growing more and more capable. But what do these tell us about where the war is headed and how it might end? Let's take a look at what some military experts around the world have to say. First, it's important to understand some context around the recent surge of drone strikes. Both Russia and Ukraine have been stocking up on drones since the invasion began. Russia has purchased thousands of so-called Sahed Kamikaze drones from Iran, which it has used to launch attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure and power grids. But Ukraine has also received thousands of drones from foreign suppliers, which it began using to retaliate against Russia late last year. These include the deadly Turkish-produced Bayraktar TV-2, which can fly up to 138 miles per hour, carry a 330-pound payload, and engage in intelligence, reconnaissance, and armed missions. Ukraine has also received hundreds of smaller, but still lethal switchblade drones from the United States. Another kamikaze-style drone, Ukraine has received two varieties. One is the Switchblade 300, meant to hit smaller targets with a range of up to 6 miles. It weighs only about 5.5 pounds and can fly for up to 15 minutes. Meanwhile, the Switchblade 600 is intended for use against larger targets such as tanks or armored vehicles. It weighs about 50 pounds and can fly for up to 40 minutes with a range of 25 miles. A third variety are the little-known Phoenix Ghost drones, also supplied by the US, which are similar to switchblades but with enhanced targeting capabilities. Back in December, Pentagon spokesman John Kirby stated that we believe that this particular system would very nicely suit their needs, particularly in eastern Ukraine. It was developed for a set of requirements that very closely match what the Ukrainians need right now in Donbass. Finally, Ukraine has also been heavily utilizing the DJI Mavic 3, a small, commercial drone which soldiers have used primarily for locating attacks from Russia and lack advanced capabilities. They can only fly a distance of fewer than 19 miles and can only fly for about 46 minutes. Collectively, all these drones have proven incredibly valuable to Ukrainian forces, allowing them to take the fight to Putin in unexpected ways. The latest examples of this are a series of attacks on Russia which experts suggest are shaping operations. A standard part of modern military practice, these range from symbolic strikes to more significant attacks, all designed to keep an enemy off balance and confused, shaping their mindset before a major offensive. John Spencer, a former U.S. Army major who chairs urban warfare studies at the Modern War Institute at West Point, stated that they are Ukrainian gray zone operations that require Russia to expend resources, be that troops or information operations. They're like a magician's sleight of hand. They deceive the viewer and force his attention elsewhere. Drone strikes have become a major part of this strategy by demonstrating Russian vulnerability and sowing confusion among commanders and soldiers alike. In May, two drones exploded above the Kremlin itself, with several more blowing up above Moscow later that month. Mike Martin, a former British Army officer, 
and author of How to Fight a War, recently said, the idea is to create a lot of dilemmas for the Russian command structure, and that Ukraine is using the Russian playbook against Russia. The first of these attempted drone attacks actually took place all the way back in December, when Russian air defenses shot down a Ukrainian drone over Engels Air Base, with the falling debris killing three soldiers. The base is located roughly 400 miles northeast of Ukraine's border and is home to Russian bombers which have carried out numerous attacks. This was an early indication that Ukraine had begun to pivot to drone warfare, allowing it to take the conflict back across Russia's border. The Ukrainian military did not officially admit to the attack, but Air Force spokesman Yuri Anat said the explosions were the result of what Russia was doing on Ukrainian soil. According to Russian media reports, there have been more than 60 of these suspected drone strikes during 2023, mostly in the Bryansk and Belgorod regions in Russia, near the northeastern border with Ukraine, as well as in Russian annexed Crimea. The primary targets have been oil facilities, airfields, and energy infrastructure, all crucial to maintaining Putin's war machine. Leila Guest, an analyst at Civilian Security Consultancy, told the BBC that Ukrainian forces will highly likely prioritize targeting oil refineries, as well as railway infrastructure, and wider Russian logistics to cause maximum disruption as part of their strategy ahead of the impending counteroffensive. The attacks have also made it clear to Moscow that Ukraine now has the capabilities to strike deep inside Russia itself, potentially giving Putin and his top supporters pause. David Senciotti, editor of the noted aviationist blog, noted that although Ukraine has not confirmed that its armed forces carried out the attacks on Moscow, I think that the preemptive raids we've seen in the last year prove that Ukraine has the capability to launch long-range attacks of that kind from within Ukrainian territory. Across the same period, Ukraine has rapidly increased its production and acquisition of new drones to meet its soldiers' growing demand. Along with appeals to Western allies, Zelensky's government has relaxed import laws and scrapped taxes for drone parts and equipment. Previously, such rules meant that receiving parts like GPS modules or thermal cameras could take 15 days. At the same time, Ukraine also changed its tax code rules, so importers of drones do not pay import duty and VAT for drones and their components. The massive expansion of the drone program has been funded by a successful fundraising campaign called the Army of Drones, which has raised more than $108 million with the help of celebrity supporters like Star Wars' Mark Hamill. And the money isn't just going toward buying and building new drones for the war effort, but also on providing their operators with advanced training. Recently, reporters from the BBC were invited to one of the secretive training sessions for drone pilots. They described more than a dozen teams of pilots flying small drones across a field, searching for markers resembling military targets, all while an instructor gave them tips for staying hidden in the woods. The instructor, going only by the moniker Slava, said that drones are our eyes. We can see the occupier very well from the top, so we can adjust artillery and find and neutralize the enemy. And organizers from the Army of Drones campaign say they have built or purchased an extra 3,300 drones since the effort began last July. Some 400 people have even sent their own hobby drones to Ukrainian troops in the mail, and soon, they're likely to have even more of them. Ukraine's Minister for Digital Transformation, Mikhailo Fedorov, has boasted of a Ukrainian drone called the R-18 that can fly from Kyiv to Moscow and back. Although Fedorov denied he was calling for drone strikes on Russia, he claimed that we have defense forces who plan operations and our task is to do everything we can so that the country has enough UAVs for them to be used for all military purposes. So, what exactly are these military purposes? Well, it's pretty clear that one major goal is to keep Russia's war planners from getting too comfortable. Back in March, multiple drones making it past Russian air defenses led authorities to close the airspace around St. Petersburg, halting all departures and arrivals at the main airport Pulkovo, while Ukrainian drone strikes on the Russian border regions of Bryansk and Belgorod were a regular occurrence in early 2023, this was the first attack which reflected a more ambitious effort, and it set many Russian supporters of the war on edge, making it clear that the violence triggered by their invasion is finally reaching Russia proper. Andrei Medvedev, a commentator with Russian state television who serves as a deputy speaker of Moscow's city legislature and runs a popular blog about the war, claimed that the strikes of exploding drones on targets behind our lines will be part of the coming offensive. Another former top military official, Viktor Alksnis, noted that the drone attacks marked the expansion of the conflict and criticized Putin for failing to deliver a stronger response. 
During May and June, the frequency and severity of these drone attacks increased yet again. Military analyst and retired U.S. Major General James Spider Marks told CNN that the drone strikes are hugely important for Ukraine's counteroffensive. He noted that until now, Russians in the border areas have had sanctuary where they can go back, they can refit, reorganize, rest, refuel, etc., so they're able to prepare for engagements. When you're in sanctuary, that gives you all the advantages. But when you have no ability to rest, no ability to refuel, and you're back there and being attacked, that reduces your ability to concentrate forces going forward. That goes for both material and psychological readiness, where Russian troops have already been lacking for the past year. So these are the deep fires which are essential to achieve that operational maneuver," added Marx. If the Ukrainians can continue to apply pressure across the border into the sanctuary areas where the Russian forces are, it will limit the number of Russian forces and it will give an advantage to the Ukrainians to achieve that level of success. This is a critical step to keep Russia from holding the hundreds of miles of fortified trenches it has dug across eastern Ukraine, a vital element of the coming counterattack. If Ukrainian forces can use drones to halt the supply lines and reinforcements, it will allow room for their artillery, tanks, and infantry to press forward. As Marx put it, this is synchronization that we probably haven't seen at this level yet. There's a difference between tactical success and operational victories. You have to have the volume of forces to tie tactical victories together and achieve this penetration. Then you can hold on one side and reduce in that direction. If Ukraine follows this strategy, it suggests that the counteroffensive will use the drone strikes to cut a swath through Russian lines, potentially retaking large pieces of territory without air superiority. The increasingly frequent use of such tactics was highlighted again at the beginning of June, when drones struck two oil refineries in southern Russia, causing authorities to transfer more troops to several border areas in hopes of shoring up their defensive lines. As the Wall Street Journal reported, authorities in Russia's Krasnodar region said the Ilyinsky oil refinery was largely unaffected by a suspected drone attack. But a blaze at the Afipsky refinery engulfed over 1,000 square feet of territory, likely as the result of a drone, according to regional governor Vinyamin Kondratyev. Then, at nearly the same time, a wave of drones struck residential buildings in Moscow, including several which hit the Rublyovka district, housing the city's political and business elite, and only miles from Putin's official Nova Ogaryova residence. While Putin and Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu called the attacks terrorism against peaceful Russian citizens, Ukrainian officials dismissed such comparisons. Major General Kyrylo Budanov stated that all of those who have tried to frighten us, dreaming that it would bring some kind of effect, you will regret it very soon. We won't make you wait for our response. All will see it very soon. While casualties were low, it's likely that Ukraine is using its inexpensive drones to test out Russian air defenses for future action. Russia's defense ministry said the attack used eight fixed-wing drones, five of which were shot down by its Pantsir air defenses. Three were deflected from their targets by radio electronic defenses. Still, Moscow is some 280 miles from the Ukrainian border, meaning that the drones were able to move undetected for significant periods of time. Western officials say such attacks are a strong signal that the conflict has veered away from any scenario desired by the Kremlin. In a statement, the UK defense ministry noted, that since the start of May 2023, Russia has increasingly ceded the initiative in the conflict and is reacting to Ukrainian action rather than actively progressing toward its own war aims. It's also becoming clear that the threat from Ukraine's drone attacks is really messing with Putin and his cronies. In a televised address, he boasted the Russian air defenses had been effective, but also that they had some room for improvement. Others were far more direct. Yevgeny Prigozhin, head of the Wagner paramilitary group, criticized the Russian defense ministry for failing to keep its citizens in the capital safe, posting on Telegram that, you've done nothing to attack, why the f have you allowed drones to fly into Moscow? Other cracks began to show among public supporters who Putin has relied on to maintain support for his disastrous invasion. A top pro-war Telegram blogger who goes by the handle Rybar raged that if the goal of the assault was to stress out the population, then the fact of Ukrainian drones appearing in the skies over Moscow has done enough of that already. A senior anonymous Ukrainian official seemed to confirm that psychological distress was the main objective of any operation that might be taking place, stating that a successful offensive starts with a successful psychological offensive. Their Russian morale is not at its highest level, and their borders are not impenetrable. 
It also seems as though Ukraine's drone strikes are meant to make the general Russian population feel fear and discomfort, similar to what Ukrainians have dealt with for the last year. One attack on a power station near the Ukrainian border left days-long blackouts in two Russian villages. By doing so, Ukrainian operators may also hope to expose residents to even more Russian government incompetence, as local authorities struggle to repair damage to the substations. Yet the Ukrainian strategy may prove to be something of a double-edged sword. Western officials remain very nervous at the prospect of Ukraine striking inside Russia itself and potentially escalating the conflict. The US has remained Ukraine's main benefactor, recently announcing another $300 million in military aid to Ukraine, including Patriot munitions and other air defense equipment, more artillery and tank shells, and other equipment including mine clearing systems. That brings overall US security assistance to more than $37.6 billion since the start of the invasion. But as reporters from the Wall Street Journal have pointed out, continued attacks inside Russia, if carried out by Ukraine, threaten to raise tensions with Washington, which has urged Kyiv not to carry out strikes on Russian soil or potentially discourage the transfer of more advanced aid by other Western partners. This is a sentiment echoed by US officials themselves, who have stressed that their weapon transfers are intended only for defensive operations. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre recently told reporters that we've been gathering information about exactly what happened. We do not support attacks inside of Russia, period. At the same time, however, she also noted that the Biden administration remained committed to providing Ukrainians with the equipment and training necessary to retake their own sovereign territory. Authorities from Germany, another of Ukraine's major Western supporters, offered similar concerns. One senior German official told the journal that the drone attacks raised major concerns about the potential supply of weapons, such as Taurus missiles, to Ukraine. Such long-range weapons would make it even easier for Ukrainian forces to strike at Moscow which Germany has said it does not want to happen. It's also possible that the escalating violence inside Russia's borders could change the calculus for the country's tacit supporters such as China, which has so far avoided sending any lethal aid to Putin. This means that Zelensky's government is left playing a delicate balancing act when it comes to drone strikes in Russian territory. Many officials likely see them as the best way to prime the battle space for a counteroffensive but worry about going too far and losing the enormous international support they've enjoyed so far in the war. Their current solution, it appears, is twofold. They've so far avoided using the drones given by NATO countries, relying on independently obtained or built models. Similarly, top officials are apparently continuing to conduct the strikes while officially distancing themselves from any attribution. Ukrainian presidential adviser Mikhailo Podolyak, for instance, publicly denied that Kyiv was behind the attacks. In an online interview, he stated that, We certainly enjoy watching and predicting more attacks, but we certainly don't have a direct involvement. Ukrainian Air Force spokesman Yuri Ignat also dismissed the official allegations, claiming that these are their internal problems. They'll have more and more such problems. A spokesperson for the Ukrainian security services told the press that we will comment on the instances of cotton only after our victory, he said. Quoting the head of the security service Vasil Maliuk, the spokesperson added that regardless, cotton has been burning, is burning, and will continue burning. Cotton is a common Ukrainian slang term for explosions. It seems as though Ukraine is likely relying more heavily on covert measures in order to distance themselves from the attacks and also avoid Russian air defenses. According to a recent investigation by CNN, US intelligence officials believe that Ukraine has cultivated a network of agents and sympathizers inside Russia working to carry out acts of sabotage against Russian targets and has been providing them with drones to stage attacks. These espionage agents may have been behind many of the more improbable drone strikes, such as those on Moscow, acting from deep inside Russian lines. One European intelligence official told reporters that because the Russo-Ukrainian border is so vast and difficult to control, it is an ideal location for smugglers to operate. You also have to consider that this is a peripheral area of Russia, the official said. Survival is everyone's problem, so cash works wonders. It's unclear exactly who is controlling the funding and operations, but it is most likely being managed indirectly through Ukrainian intelligence agents without requiring constant authorization by Zelensky to preserve deniability. And these operations also appear to have been planned far in advance as they build on the mysterious fires and explosions inside Russia over the last year, which have targeted oil and fuel depots 
railways, military enlistment officers, warehouses, and pipelines. Now that the frequency is increasing, one U.S. intelligence official said, the current push is a culmination of months of effort. There have been, for months now, a pretty consistent push by some in Ukraine to be more aggressive, the individual added. And there has certainly been some willingness at senior levels. The challenge has always been their ability to do it. Leaked documents from several months ago seem to confirm this, as Zelensky suggested striking Russian deployment locations in Russia's Rostov Oblast using drones, since Ukraine lacked the long-range weapons to do so. Even so, despite the public hesitation by Western officials, in private, many have struck a different tune. Some related that they believe the cross-border attacks are a smart military strategy that could divert Russian resources to protecting its own territory. Others have been more overt with their praise, such as UK Foreign Secretary James Cleverly, who told reporters that Ukraine has the right to project force beyond its borders to undermine Russia's ability to project force into Ukraine itself. Legitimate military targets beyond its own borders are internationally recognized as being part of a nation's self-defense. We should recognize that." French Vice Admiral Nicolas Vaujour expressed similar thoughts, telling CNN that Ukraine's actions are not forbidden, and that there is a war there, and it could concern you, the Russian public, in the future. And so it's a good way for Ukrainians to address a message not only to Vladimir Putin, but to the Russian population. All things considered, it doesn't seem likely that Ukraine will stop its drone strikes on Russia anytime soon as the strategy has forced Russian military planners to worry about their own necks for a change. But what do you think? Will the drone strikes allow Ukraine to mount a successful counteroffensive, or will the escalation lead to a decline in Western support? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. This is the biggest country on planet Earth with a total area of 6,601,665 square miles and a land area of 6,322,142 square miles. It represents 11% of the total world's land mass and is 1.8 times larger than America. But Russia isn't just a big country, it's a big problem. And if it collapses as a result of the consequences of the war in Ukraine, this will impact everybody everywhere. Yes, even you. But why? And in what way? Let's find out. Send in the tanks, uh, if you can find any. Russia has always prided itself on its Victory Day celebration, held to commemorate the Soviet victory over the Nazis in World War II. The bombastic parade held annually in Red Square has historically served as a visual barometer of Russian military power. It is common to see rows upon rows of marching soldiers, jets, tanks, armored vehicles and intercontinental ballistic missiles file past an absorbed crowd and its approving leadership. This year, things were a little different. The Kremlin scaled things back, like a lot. There was no flyover, there were no Iskanders, there were 3,000 fewer soldiers, most of them cadets and students at local military universities. And rather than a steady stream of T-90Ms, T-14 Armatas, a solitary World War II vintage T-34 tank motored past the reviewing stand. For how staggering Russian tank losses have been in the Ukraine thus far, it's tempting to think this T-34 is actually the bottom of the barrel for Putin's forces. After all, having lost 192 tanks in the First Chechen War, 23 tanks in the Second Chechen War, and 3 tanks in the Russo-Georgian War, Russia has now lost an impressive 1,937 tanks in Ukraine thus far, as of May 2023. And that is just how many have been visually confirmed. Just let that sink in. There are more tanks yet in Russia's arsenal, but most of them are currently employed in Ukraine, along with the lion's share of its military forces, explaining the humbler military parade presence than years past. Factor in the recent drone scare over the Kremlin, and we can see that this year's parade was held despite legitimate strategic red flags and security concerns unfathomable just one year ago. Some say the event, designed to capture the public's imagination and promote the heady militaristic nationalism of the Soviet glory days, is merely papering over the cracks in Russia's armed forces. Of these, there are many. The irony is that the last time the Russian military orchestrated a military victory of any consequence was exactly 78 years ago during World War II. Today, 
Its operations in Ukraine are on track to follow a more common Russian pattern of strategic overstretch and ignominious withdrawal. There are increasing warning signs that the weaknesses we are seeing are evidence of far graver threats to Putin's regime. Recently, Yevgeny Prigozhin, chief of the Wagner mercenary group fighting around Bakhmut in Ukraine, criticized the Kremlin for not sending enough ammunition to make a difference on the front lines. Victory day is the victory of our grandfathers, he vented on social media. We haven't earned that victory one millimeter. It should surprise no one that victory now looks far from attainable. On the contrary, in the light of economic sanctions and the declining financial health of the Russian Federation, some are predicting far worse for Putin's forces and his political future. With less to be positive about now than at any point in the war, could Putin's regime actually be on the brink of collapse? And what might that look like? In a recent survey of 167 foreign policy experts held by the Atlantic Council, 46% of them believed that the collapse or disintegration of Russia could happen in the next 10 years. 40% claimed that this would happen internally for a number of reasons, particularly because of a revolution, civil war, or political disintegration. We all know that wars gone awry can exacerbate and expedite the deterioration of a society faster than just about anything else. But Putin's abysmal strategic direction of Russia's war in Ukraine could have the country on the fast track to obscurity, oblivion, or far, far worse, outright dissolution. There are two prime historical touchpoints in modern history we tend to reference when we talk about a Russian political collapse, which is really saying something if you think about it. The first is the most recent, when the Soviet Union broke apart at the end of the Cold War. In case you're too young to remember, this collapse caught the world by surprise. Many were shocked to see a country so large and powerful, on paper at least, suddenly and rapidly fall apart. Some blame Russia's current state of affairs on the West's response to that significant geopolitical moment. Heralded as the start of a new era of freedom, liberation and self-determination, many worried the independence of a host of ex-Soviet satellites and the weakening of Russia would destabilize the international order. Since the 1990s, all of the Soviet Union's 21 constituent republics declared themselves sovereign. Putin, a staunch imperialist who pines for the good old days, took this pretty hard. After he rose to power, the West tried to maintain dialogue and positive relations with the Kremlin, even as it embarked on a repressive imperialist foreign policy with deployments in the Second Chechen War, the 2008 invasion of Georgia, and the 2014 invasion of Ukraine. Since the end of the Cold War, Putin has created a regime that actively restricts the rights of the dozens of different national and ethnic groups within the boundaries of the modern Russian state. He wants to be a czar, with a wheel of dependent satellites to exploit for natural resources, manpower, and money. Russian officials and Kremlin propagandists have made it their goal to promote this agenda, making the ruthless look benign. Someday, who is to say Moldova, Kazakhstan, or other Central Asian nations might not come under the tighter thumb of Russian imperial aggression. What would it mean for European security? That's why Ukraine matters. The war there poses serious problems for Putin's imperial ambitions. He and his cabinet thought it would be a short war, one that would permanently bring Ukraine back into Russia's orbit. Instead, he is suffering one of the most catastrophic military setbacks of the past hundred years one that has already surpassed the devastation caused by the Russo-Japanese War of 1905, and one approaching the scale with the type of suffering that preceded the other major Russian collapse, the collapse of the Tsarist Empire in 1917. That, in case you forgot, was the first time the Russian Federation dissolved, the event that triggered Russia's chaotic, bloody descent into Soviet-era communism. And let me tell you, it was a whirlwind of a time to be alive. One moment you are a Russian soldier, fighting Germany and Austria-Hungary with the Entente Allies on the Eastern Front. The next, you learn the inefficient and widely corrupt Tsarist government can no longer sustain the economic and material costs of the war effort. Before you know it, tens of thousands of soldiers, workers and peasants are fed up, rising up, overthrowing the imperial government and installing the Bolsheviks in power. Countless Russian minorities yearned in those turbulent times for some form of recognition and freedom which had been elusive under the Tsars. When the empire disintegrated and crashed out of the war, social, economic, and socio-political ruptures terminated the central control of the state and enabled the temporary formation of a series of new polities, including the Siberian Republic and other former territories that got their first taste of independence. 
These include Finland, Poland, Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. It wouldn't be long before the Soviets, consolidating state power once more under the communist flag of the USSR, gobbled them back up. And you wonder why they were more than happy to join NATO in the aftermath of the Cold War? Most experts believe that a modern Russian collapse will be swifter, more brutal, and more akin to the revolutionary crisis of 1917 than the Soviet collapse of 1991. It is a possible scenario. The conditions in Russia today do bear a passing resemblance to those within the Tsarist Empire at the time of its fall. A deeply corrupt and morally bankrupt ruling class led by oligarchs, aristocrats, and elites with no conception of the economic suffering of the masses. Ethnic minorities in places like Dagestan, Ichkeria, Igushetia, Ossetia, Kabardino, the Caucasus, Tuva, Buryatia, and others inhumanely treated, discriminated against, and used as cannon fodder in Putin's wars. A population in serious demographic decline, growing mistrust of Russian institutions and governance, intensive state oppression, a country that will owe billions, if not trillions of dollars, to rebuild Ukraine when the time comes. If you think any singular cause will cause Putin's downfall, you'd be wrong. History is non-linear, multi-causal and contingent. Yanis Bagashki, author of Failed State, A Guide to Russia's Rupture, put it best. The demise of the current Russian Federation is unlikely to follow a single path, unlike that of the Soviet Union where 15 Union republics became independent states almost by default. The fracturing of the state is likely to be chaotic, prolonged, sequential, conflictive and increasingly violent. It can result in the full separation of some federal units and the amalgamation of others into new federal or confederal arrangements. Bruno Tertrace, an advisor for geopolitics at the Institute Montaigne, has argued that the only good thing about a Russian collapse today is that the nuclear issue would be far less serious than it was with the Soviet Union. Elites would be far more interested in preserving some semblance of authority and power rather than commit political and personal suicide by launching a nuclear attack. Most of Russia's nuclear forces today are inside the Federation, not beyond its borders like during the Cold War, when it had 7,000 nukes stationed outside Russia. Exploring the implications for Russia's future as a nuclear power if trends continue the way they are, Bruno observed, in the 1970s the Soviet Union was described as upper Volta with rockets, he said. By the 2000s it was Mexico with nuclear weapons. In 2010s, a gas station with nuclear weapons. Will it become a Somalia with nuclear weapons? So how exactly might Russia collapse? What would it mean for its neighbors? We know that a country's foreign policy is a reflection of its domestic situation, and vice versa. In Russia's case, Putin's actions have the country on the path to economic Armageddon. The price of Russian crude oil is the lowest it's been in years. Within the first two months of 2023, the state had already fallen into a deficit level normally achieved in an entire year. It isn't profiting much from its sale of hydrocarbons to India and China. Its import sales are collapsing. Its GDP has shrunk by 4%. Air cargo fell by 60% in 2022. There has been a massive loss of technical expertise and specialized equipment as foreign corporations and businesses fled the country. It lacks vital semiconductors and other specialized machinery imported from the West, meaning its entire economy, to say nothing of its military power, is becoming more and more primitive. The net result is an increasing reliance on states like China for resources and technology, systems that can be integrated but take time. While that happens, poverty will spread, it will be harder to receive good health care, and the population will grow more discontent with the government. These factors could affect the strength of existing national movements or ethnic minorities within the Russian Federation seeking greater independence and autonomy. Moscow is far removed from many of these population centers and has, until now, relied on a technocratic system of oligarchical control where Kremlin-appointed elites receive massive checks to keep their provinces in line. These leaders, in turn, return the regional profits to the Kremlin's coffers. Russian elites are deeply dependent on Moscow's political and economic authority for their own legitimacy. When this goes bankrupt, what happens? When the public loses faith in these Kremlin-appointed governors and the Kremlin can no longer provide them with the support they need to maintain order, there's a chance that local separatist movements will grow. In resource and industrial-rich regions, there might be the temptation to cut ties with Moscow. 
and go it alone with the support of the people. This happened in 2020, when mass protests erupted in eastern Khabarovsk after the arrest and 22-year imprisonment of Sergei Fergal, a member of the opposition party. This caused a power vacuum that Moscow had to fill. But it needs resources and support to do so. And with the war dragging on and the bite of sanctions becoming more and more acute, it is increasingly likely that Putin will struggle to plug the holes in the dike as the flood of discontent spreads. Unlike the Soviet Union, whose power rested on the Comintern and whose governing authority always had a reasonably clear line of succession, nobody knows what will happen in Putin's vertical, highly centralized hierarchy if the figurehead falls. Will there be a civil war? Will a power struggle ensue between Putin's elites? Will Moscow, already neck deep in its military invasion of Ukraine, have the resources to suppress any separatist movements that arise? Back in 1917, this was the avenue that led to the downfall of the Tsarist Empire. Like falling dominoes, the Ukrainian Central Rada presented its first universal declaration. Five months later, it declared the creation of the Ukrainian People's Republic. Other regions did the same. By the time you get to 1918, the Red Army was forced to suppress these movements and bring them into submission. Only Poland, Finland, Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania states with active support from the United States, Great Britain and France, the victors of World War I, managed to secure their independence, if only for a time. The Bolsheviks managed to set the ship straight, but it came at a massive cost. Putin has to hope his cronies are as committed as the Bolsheviks were when his grasp on power is brought into question. So far, one of his tactics has been to feature minority participants in the Ukraine occupation like Kadyrov's Chechens in his propaganda campaign for two purposes – to both show Federation solidarity in the war and, if things go sour, to have a scapegoat for the Russian army's broader operational failures. If Russia collapsed, it would probably start with a breakaway movement in one territory that spreads like a virus to others on the country's periphery. Chechnya, for example, could be the first domino to fall. They have a history of enmity with the Kremlin, after all, and a recent one at that. Local elites like Kadyrov will be posturing for greater political power if they start to glimpse fractures in Putin's existing political system. Already struggling to deal with Ukraine, how might Russia deal with discontented Chechen and Wagner mercenaries who, more loyal to the cult of their own determined rulers than they are to Russia itself, come marching back to Moscow? Could these leaders, fueled by vengeful hatred for the way they were left to die on the battlefields of Ukraine with too few weapons, shells and dilapidated equipment, form a Faustian pact and team up against Putin? Or will battlefield defeat and economic poverty force these sides into internecine warfare amongst themselves, a battle royale for ultimate political power? Ok, it might be a stretch, and we should temper our prognosis just a little. While it's tempting to look at online maps depicting the collapse of Russia by 2025, with fantastical graphics carving the country up into dozens of independent republics, the reality is that Russia's internal divisions are far less stark than they appear. According to Alexei Gusev, a fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the maps betray a delusion on the part of their authors that is common to many political forecasters. These observers, all map fetishists, mistake the administrative boundaries of Russia's provinces for real borders of socio-economic life, unaware that the true divisions in Russian society almost never coincide with the arbitrary lines drawn by Communist Party functionaries in the first half of the last century. Russia is extremely unlikely to disintegrate along its regional borders for geographical, sociological, economical and political administrative reasons. Sociologically, Gusev argues, most of Russia's regions share the same basic values and attitudes. For those praying for Putin's downfall, just know this. Russia always ends up rebuilding itself. Preferentially, a new, more egalitarian form of governance would emerge from the ashes. Historically, hardship, defeat and political turmoil have been the breadbasket of totalitarianism. As long as Putin remains in power, it is unlikely that Russia's collapse will resemble the peaceful disintegration of 1991. Putin looks set to run, in air quotes, naturally for president again in 2024. He'll be familiar with essays by the likes of Ival Ilyin, who wrote in 1950 what dismemberment of Russia entails for the world. He knows that battlefield victories will all but seal his grip on power for decades to come. But with a hard year of campaigning ahead, one in which Ukraine will slowly integrate new Western weapon systems into its counteroffensive strategy, Putin will be forced to drain Russian resources further, 
sending young men to die on the front lines. Hatred will grow. Putin will be forced to suppress these feelings to prevent widespread discontent. This begins a vicious cycle in which the only thing that can save his dictatorship is more suppression, which leads to more discontent. And you see where this is going. Edward Lucas, senior advisor and senior fellow at the Center for European Policy Analysis, put it best. As the butcher's bill mounts in Ukraine, the war story contains only stale bombast. The lie machine insists that black is white. The result is cognitive dissonance between what Russians experience in their daily lives and what the state propaganda machine is telling them. As we know from Soviet times, that can last for a long time, but not indefinitely. The whiff of change is in the air. The truth, more than anything, is that the cracks in the Russian power pyramid have been present since Putin came to power. His actions over the past year have only accelerated a process of decline already long in motion. It is fighting an unwinnable war. If it refuses to pull out of Ukraine and rebuild its military, it will soon be unable to prevent those who want to leave the Federation from doing so. If the oligarchs turn on Putin, Will there be a struggle between intelligence services, the National Guard, and foreign mercenaries? Will Putin be assassinated? Russia has committed several grave geopolitical blunders throughout the past hundred years. Could this be their worst? Could Putin survive politically or physically a military defeat? Let us know in the comments. Of ...operations in eastern Ukraine as Ukraine prepares to embark on similar operations with the goal of severing Russia's supply lines cutting the land bridge connecting occupied Crimea and Russian positions further east, and causing a general Russian collapse. It's time to take a closer look at what exactly went down in the Battle of Bilohorivka. On May 12, 2022, just three months after Russia's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine, drone footage was released to the public by the Ukraine Armed Forces, revealing a small portion of the Siverskaya Donets River winding its way through Bilohorivka in Ukraine's eastern industrial heartland. The footage revealed the aftermath of a lopsided encounter. Dirt roads approached the river from both sides. On them, the burnt-out hulks of several tanks and armored vehicles are clearly visible. Partly submerged and arcing halfway across the river, a wrecked Russian pontoon bridge attests to the tactical objectives that the Russians had in mind. River crossings in any war are among the most risky maneuvers. This one, conducted by Russian military officials, under a lot of pressure to achieve the Kremlin's tactical objectives in the Donbass, was haphazardly planned and even more haphazardly executed. With the intention of striking Lyman, a city of 20,000, some 17 miles west, the Russians installed a lightweight pontoon bridge over the muddy waterway and in early May began their attempts to transfer an entire battalion tactical group to the other side. Ukrainian forces of the 17th Tank Brigade caught them in the act. According to a Ukrainian engineer and EOD officer, his unit could see the Russians massing on the other side of the river. As early as May 6, his commander asked him to conduct a forward reconnaissance mission along the river to gauge the enemy's intent. The next day, he and a recon unit went to the area of Hryhorivka and Bilorivka to get a first-hand look. It did not take long for the engineer to get a sense of what was happening. Given the river's not insignificant current, he predicted the Russians would have to deploy motorboats to build the pontoon bridge. Since such bridges were mostly modular and could be trucked to the front in large sections, it would, he predicted, take them two hours at least to finish the job. After a day of watching, he notified the unit watching the river to listen for motorboats and report back as soon as they heard them. This last warning was prescient, since visibility he claimed was horrible, compounding the fog already in the area the Russians had set parts of nearby forests on fire and deployed massive smoke screens to conceal their actions. The observers had to hear the boats, he reiterated. Then the Ukrainians would know it was on. Observations in hand, the engineer returned and reported his findings to his superiors. On the morning of May 8th, they heard the boats. Like clockwork, they sent up a drone. True to the engineer's word, the Russians were building the pontoon bridge right where the Ukrainians had predicted it would be. Reports shot back to the nearby Ukrainian command headquarters. They could not see Russian infantry, but they could make out the bridge being constructed. Coordinates were relayed to Ukrainian artillery batteries. The guns were trained on that small crossing. By then, the Russians had built seven of the eight bridge sections and started the slow process of moving men and material across the river. And then the shelling began. It had only taken 20 minutes from the first warning to the order to open fire. 
Aided by drone surveillance and forward observers, heavy Ukrainian artillery batteries unleashed a hellacious salvo, which caught the Russians entirely by surprise. I was still in the area, the engineer remarked after the engagement, and I have never seen or heard such heavy combat in my life. The shelling sparked pandemonium and terror. Direct hits on leading vehicles at the water's edge caused others to reverse up the river's muddy banks. Further hits on escaping vehicles boxed in the rest. The east bank of the river was torn apart by exploding munitions. Fleeing Russian soldiers abandoned the pontoon bridge. One section destroyed outright, the other left intact. Allegedly 30 to 50 vehicles became trapped on the Ukrainian side, with no way to get back across. They certainly tried using bits of broken bridge to try to float back. It was all to no avail, and then they tried to arrange a new bridge to be built. The Russian high command could not deliver. That's when the Ukrainian aircraft showed up on the scene. They concentrated even more firepower on the shattered bridgehead, while the artillery continued churning water, mud, blood, and body parts up and down the shoreline. The result was devastating. By May 10th, photos of the disaster started to emerge online. More than 70 vehicles, including six dozen tanks and other armored vehicles, the bridge itself, all disabled or destroyed in a matter of hours. The best estimates were that more than a thousand troops perished in the maelstrom of artillery and air-delivered destruction. That is equivalent to an entire battalion tactical group wiped off the earth faster than they could say Spasiba, Comrade Putin. There were four other attempted crossings at Bilirivka alone, all of which were promptly destroyed by the Ukrainian armed forces leading up to May 13th. On that day, the last remaining Russian troops in the area finally fled back to their side of the river, officially ending the Russian thrust on Liman. Offensive operations can be disastrously costly, remember? Just ask the Russians. Now, there's another takeaway from this analysis that we should bear in mind as we contemplate the outcomes of the ongoing Ukrainian counteroffensive. It is this. You can't stop your analysis with one bad tactical engagement. The devastating loss of an entire battalion barely impacted the overall weight of the Russian offensive in the Donbass that spring. Even though the Russians failed to get to Bilorivka from the north in their crossings, adjacent forces were able to concentrate on Liman from the east and Bilorivka from the south and east. A month later, they successfully occupied Sivierodonetsk and Lysychansk. Ukrainian defenders tried to hold the line, but ultimately failed. By July 3rd, Lysychansk capitulated, and the entire Ukrainian front collapsed under the weight of Russian pressure aggregating from the east. Ukraine had no choice but to retreat and reform behind a new defensive line around the city of Siversk, and thus ended the First Battle of Bielorivka. The result? Russia claimed the control of the entire Luhansk Oblast, achieving their overall objective. But the story didn't end there. There are three levels to war, the tactical level, the operational level, and the strategic level. Students of military history are often quick to confuse tactical virtuosity with military genius. He who wins a key battle is often the one we remember most. The operational level is where battles get strung together into campaigns. And it is here where the Russians seem to have finally overwhelmed their Ukrainian enemy in the case we've just discussed. The Ukrainians were able to deliver a stunning victory along the Siverskaya Donets River, obliterating an entire Russian battalion. But the Russians were able to exert pressure elsewhere, causing the significance of this isolated engagement to dim in the overall operational picture. If you stop your analysis at the operational level, however, you still miss out on arguably the most important level, the strategic one, where states deploy all the means at their disposal, be they political, economic, military, and financial, to achieve clearly discernible aims and objectives. Continuing the story after the fall of the Luhansk Oblast, Ukraine reevaluated its position during a crucial operational pause. Russia seemed set on shifting its focus to the Donetsk Oblast, where it had fought for eight years already. It was intent on controlling Bakhmut and its surroundings, a city whose name would become synonymous with attrition in the months to come as the site of appalling bloodshed and devastation. In the interim, Ukraine knew it had the breathing space to conduct a much-needed mobilization that summer, something it did as it received new injections of Western military equipment and training. Strategically, this was a crucial period. Somehow, content with their operational gains despite having presided over a string of embarrassing failures given their starting point in February 2022, 
the Russian high command decided to send significant amounts of its forces on leave to recuperate and rest. This enabled the Ukrainians to blunt ongoing Western Russian advances at little cost. From July onward, only positional and trench battles took place on the siversk bilirivka route. If you've been paying attention, you know that Ukraine, between July and September, was cooking up a special surprise for Putin's special military operation. By applying pressure elsewhere, the Ukrainians were able to liberate adjacent cities, which unblocked their approach to Bilorivka. As part of the stunning early September counteroffensive, they managed to retake Bilorivka from Russian control and set up a defensive line outside the city. The city was targeted by Russian artillery and, like so many cities around it in Luhansk Oblast, was completely razed to the ground. Over the ensuing months, Bilorivka remained the site of heavy fighting as the war of maneuver ground to a halt. Ukraine liberated Kharkiv and was soon to liberate Kherson in the south. Meanwhile, Ukrainian forces managed to hold on outside the line at Bilorivka, repulsing heavy Russian assaults through October. Strategically, holding in Bilorivka was part of a broader intention of maneuvering elsewhere. For the Ukrainians, it worked. For the Russians, they became hyper-focused on reclaiming lost territory in this single eastern region. After a dogged fight to recapture Bilorivka in November by the Wagner Group and the 6th Cossack Regiment of the Luhansk People's Republic, they trained their sights on Solodar and Bakhmut, central nodes just 50 kilometers to the south where, as we all know, Russian and Ukrainian forces became bogged down in a winter of heavy attritional battles. Launching their own offensive in February, Russia poured its forces back into the meat grinder to reclaim lost territory during the Kharkiv counteroffensive. Most of these actions occurred south of Kremina, and in and around Bilirivka and down through Bakhmut. It took consistent and, to Western eyes, suicidal frontal Russian attacks to make minimal progress. The Russians sustained catastrophically high losses during this bloodletting period, and while the Ukrainians suffered severe losses as well, they have kept their eyes on the wider strategic prize, preparing for the current offensive all the while. So, how will Ukraine's counteroffensive unfold? According to Dr. Jack Watling, senior research fellow at London's Royal United Services Institute, Ukraine has to accomplish three things for their offensive to succeed. First, they will do what they have been doing for some time now – engage in counter-battery missions and artillery duels with the enemy. Using Gimlers and Storm Shadow missiles, they will target Russian command and control posts and munition stockpiles in an aim to cripple the Russians' ability to organize and counteract the next phase of the Ukrainian operations. There are indications that this is already bearing fruit. At the time of this writing, a HIMARS strike killed hundreds of Russian soldiers while waiting for a commander to deliver a motivational speech near Kremlina, confirmed by several Russian military bloggers shortly after a face-to-face -face meeting with President Vladimir Putin to discuss the war in Ukraine. Apparently, the goal of this meeting was to assuage widespread discontent in the Russian information space about recent attacks in the Belgorod region, drone strikes inside Russian territory, and border security in general. And within hours, they caught wind of the HIMARS strike. One prominent blogger, Starsh Eddy, fumed on Telegram in the aftermath of the episode. If by the middle of the second year of the war there are commanders who gather personnel in one big pile and then wait for the enemy artillery to strike, then such commanders should be shot," he complained. Near Kremina, a tragic accident occurred in one of the divisions that were about to go on the offensive. For two hours, people stood in a crowd in one place and waited for their division commander to say his motivating words, but instead of him, the high Mars and enemy artillery had their say. Along with these types of precision strikes, Ukraine will try to do the next step get Russia to commit its third-line reserves into front-line positions that are currently being probed and assaulted by the leading Ukrainian units. Only by pressuring the Russians broadly across the entire front and getting Russian reserves into the battle can they see the weakest points, those ripe for penetration. This will also dampen Russia's ability to scramble its reserve forces to the point Ukraine ultimately chooses. Finally, with this achieved, Ukraine will have to successfully breach the first line of Russian defenses in depth. Once this has happened, Ukraine will choose to commit its forces. Offensive operations will then enter a decisive phase. From then on, there are only two outcomes – success or failure. 
the offensive is still not close to reaching its decisive phase. Some experts predict that it might take up to two months for that to happen. There are some indications that Ukrainians have successfully breached certain forward Russian defensive positions in isolated areas, but the hard part still lies ahead. But what do you think? Will Ukraine's counteroffensive be successful? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Putin is terrified of F-16s in Ukraine, and he should be. Since basically the beginning of the Russian invasion, Ukraine has been pleading with its Western supporters for advanced fighter jets. For most of the war, the US has been staunchly opposed to giving Ukraine these systems, as they could allow for strikes far behind Russian lines, escalating the conflict. But now, officials in Kyiv might be finally getting their wish, in the form of US-made F-16s set to be delivered later this year. As of this video, the training for Ukrainian F-16 pilots has begun in Denmark and is set to begin in multiple other NATO countries such as the Netherlands. Back at the annual G7 summit in May, with Ukraine's Zelensky as a special guest, US President Joe Biden announced that the US would conduct its own training for Ukrainian F-16 pilots, which it estimated could be completed in under a year, with basic training possibly taking only four months. But where might all these jets be coming from? How important are they to Ukraine? And perhaps most importantly, how could they change the outcome of this brutal and unpredictable war? Let's start with the question of where exactly the F-16s might be coming from. There are more than 2,200 F-16s around the world, making it the most popular combat aircraft in use today. But the most likely candidates seem to be jets recently retired by the Netherlands, Denmark and Norway. These would likely be the F-16AM-BM models, which were originally acquired in the 1980s and upgraded in the 1990s. All of these would therefore be aging aircraft with high mileage and old radar systems. But even with these drawbacks, the jet software allows them to use some of the most modern and deadly weapons in the NATO arsenal, including the AIM-120 air-to-air missiles and stealthy long-range joint air-to-surface standoff missiles, or JASMs. Reports suggest that the Netherlands in particular was closely involved in the effort to get Washington to approve the F-16 training, helping convince Biden of their need in Ukraine. Interestingly, however, the F-16s aren't coming from the US at all. This is probably partially due to the tensions with China, for which the Pentagon is keeping significant material in reserve in case an air or naval battle breaks out over the Taiwan Strait or South China Sea. The other main reason is that US policymakers still worry that too aggressive or successful a strike by Ukraine could force Putin's hand in ways we'd all rather not think about. That was the rationale behind the strategy so far – give Ukraine as many surface-to-air and land capabilities as possible while avoiding the potential of an aerial strike inside Russian territory. But this logic has already been challenged by Ukraine's use of drones in so-called shaping operations in recent weeks some of which have reached as far as Moscow. Because of this, the authorization for Ukraine to receive F-16s and the associated training has been a matter of tension in Washington for months. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and several others have objected to the idea, essentially claiming that there were too many unknowns and that Ukraine has done well enough without F-16s. So the approval for other countries to ship their F-16s to Ukraine is still a big change, overriding a key condition baked into their initial sale by the US, which prohibited European allies from sending them elsewhere. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was apparently one of the driving forces behind the administration's decision, as well as helping to convince European NATO allies to get on board. Yet even so, it's unclear when any of these countries will actually be supplying the F-16s in question. The Netherlands, Belgium and Denmark are working towards replacing their current F-16s with more advanced F-35s, but have all held back on actually committing to sending the old jets to Ukraine. Similarly, the UK has offered to provide flight training, but doesn't actually operate any F-16s itself. While this may start to change once the training is complete, there's currently a lot of hesitation from the West about pushing Putin just a little too far and ending up in some sort of nuclear standoff. Some countries like Belgium also worry about diminishing their own capabilities. Not that Belgium is a likely candidate to be invaded by anyone, Others, like Denmark, have stated that they will reconsider sending F-16s if others are also doing so, but that they won't go it alone. The Netherlands and Norway appear to be similarly torn, while other countries with F-16s not in the process of being phased out are much less likely to join in. In a nutshell, at the moment it's pretty clear that even those countries which have declared support for Ukraine's push for jets either can't 
or aren't willing to provide significant numbers of them in the short to medium term. Once Ukraine actually gets the aircraft, there's another set of problems it needs to deal with. Specifically, they must be able to operate, maintain, and sustain the F-16s, which is not the easiest task. For instance, a March 2023 study by the Congressional Research Service identified several crucial conditions necessary to successfully field the jets. The biggest concerns it identified concern the supply chain. This means acquiring sufficient spare parts, allocating funding for operations and support, implementing a maintenance inventory system, training maintainers, and acquiring an ongoing supply of weapons with which to arm their F-16s. These tasks are difficult enough for countries in peacetime, with previous experience and a wide base of technical knowledge. For Ukraine, they are likely to be even trickier. Of course, if the course of the war so far is anything to judge by, Ukrainians will continue to figure out inventive solutions to logistical issues facing their military. Russians, on the other hand, have no hope of obtaining advanced fighter jets and are stuck using obsolete human wave tactics while trying to avoid kicking off a civil war in their own country. But even accounting for the staggering incompetence of the Russian military, Ukraine certainly still faces some hurdles obtaining and operating even used F-16s. If they take to the skies without plans to support these aircraft, they will break down quickly and most likely become expensive stationary targets for Russian air-to-surface missiles. This is especially true for the F-16, which can require some 18 hours of maintenance for every hour of flight time. Basically, if they do things right and don't rush it, there's a strong possibility that Ukraine won't even be using the F-16s until the end of 2023. This also suggests that many defense experts believe the war will continue for quite some time, despite the incompetence of the Russian armed forces and short mutiny of the Wagner Group PMC. By greenlighting the transfer of the F-16s, the US is essentially admitting that the war will not stop anytime soon, and that Ukraine will need continual upgrades to its firepower in a long-term war of attrition. If Ukraine can get a handle on the jet's supply and maintenance, that's when the training will really start to become important. Like any complex weapon system, the F-16 was designed to fill a particular set of roles in an existing military structure and support certain doctrines of modern warfare. To get the most out of them, the Ukrainians will need to adopt more of the practices and techniques which the plane's design caters to. Fundamentally, the F-16 was designed to help the US Air Force beat the Russian Air Force in aerial combat. Logic follows that the more the Ukrainians can fly them like the US Air Force would, the better the results will be. Of course, other NATO countries have adopted similar practices, but most of these are also quite different from the ways Ukraine has been fielding their existing fighter jets. For one thing, the F-16 was essentially designed to be a lightweight, multi-role fighter capable of doing many different missions well, but not to be the best at any of them. F-16s were definitely not intended to be operated from improvised airfields as Ukraine has been doing with many of its current aircraft. They can be especially susceptible to getting debris caught in their engines, a great way to crash before ever engaging in combat. This brings up the issue of where Ukraine would put the 200 F-16s it's asking for. RAND Corporation analysts John Hone and William Courtney recently assessed that F-16s do best on long, pristine runways. They could face difficulties on the rougher, former Soviet ones dispersed across Ukraine. To bring in Western aircraft, Ukraine might need to repave and potentially extend a number of runways, a process which Russia would likely detect. If only a few airfields were suitable and in known locations, focused Russian attacks could impede Ukrainian F-16s from flying. This is mostly because idiotic and unprepared as most of Russia's military might be, they still have access to some pretty advanced technology. This is especially true when it comes to air-to-air -to -air combat. Modern Russian air fighters such as the MiG-31 and Su-35 can see quite far with their powerful modern radars. They also have R-37 missiles that have a longer range than NATO-supplied AIM-120 AMRAMs or advanced medium-range air-to-air missiles. In other words, Russian aircraft can potentially spot Ukrainian F-16s and shoot them down before the Ukrainian pilots see them coming. Some of this has already happened with Ukraine's current fleet of Su-27 and MiG-29 fighters, and the improved capabilities of the F-16 are not enough to change this dynamic. Because of the reach of these Russian fighters, Ukrainian fighter pilots often break off missions early or operate far behind their own front lines. F-16s would operate with the same constraints, limiting their ability to perform air-to-surface missions with relatively short-range weapons like the JDAM bomb guidance kits. Because of this, even once Ukraine receives F-16s, it will still most likely have to rely on drones and other current air platforms for support. 
There's also the question of how to get the proper armaments Ukraine needs to pair with the F-16s. The best way for Ukraine to capitalize on any F-16s it receives will be advanced Western armaments which can stand up to Russian firepower. The issue? Like everything else in a war, these can be staggeringly expensive. For instance, a single AMRAM costs about $1.2 million, while it takes about two years to make one. The US could always provide existing weapons like the AMRAM from its own stockpiles, but that could leave them depleted in the event of an unexpected conflict, a risk the Pentagon is not willing to take. However, the real tactical and logistical advantages that F-16s would provide to Ukraine are long-term. A major benefit is that it will be easier for Ukraine to maintain aircraft whose parts are supplied by the United States and NATO than their current, outdated aircraft manufactured by Russia. In turn, this could also make it easier for Ukraine to integrate their air force into NATO sometime in the future, and the more Ukraine's arsenal is compatible with NATO's, the better they'll fare, and the worse off Putin will find himself. For instance, Ukraine was previously given AGM-88 high-speed anti-radiation missiles HARM, to use against ground-based radar systems. As with much of their current military arsenal, they managed to attach the system onto their MiG-29s, but the end result was far from ideal, since Soviet-era fighters were not designed to fire US-manufactured missiles. F-16s with modern software will enable Ukraine to employ HARMs and other modern weapon systems much more effectively. This includes missiles such as the AIM-9 Sidewinder and the AIM-120, which the United States and NATO are likely to provide, will be useful for Ukraine's defense against Russian cruise missiles like the KH-101 and the KH-555, and against Iranian-made Shahed Kamikaze drones. Ukraine's stockpiles of Soviet S-300 surface-to-air missiles are running out pretty quickly, and there are only so many Patriot missiles available. So even if Russia will still have some superior jets, the F-16's air-to-air capability will definitely help those ground-based defenses last longer, and it's pretty clear that this is necessary. Western military analysts have estimated that Ukraine's combined fleet belonging to air and ground forces has been depleted by more than a third since the Russian invasion began. Ukraine has lost at least 60 of its 145 fixed-wing planes and 32 of 139 helicopters, according to classified US military information leaked on the social media platform Discord in recent months. The Ukrainian Air Force rarely reveals numbers regarding its fleet or other details of tactical importance, including incidents of planes shot down or otherwise destroyed, but officials have acknowledged losses from the more than a year of war, as well as difficulties with the repair and replacement of damaged planes. Another big question is whether the United States will supply powerful JASMs to use with the F-16s. These deadly, low-detection cruise missiles are incredibly long-range and have a 1,000-pound armor-piercing warhead. It also seems there's a good chance of this happening. Britain has provided the Storm Shadow air-launched cruise missiles, and Ukraine has already put them to use. Storm Shadow is generally similar to the baseline version of JASM in terms of size, range, employment, and observability so providing JASMs would not necessarily be an escalation. F-16s utilizing JASMs could allow for Ukrainian Defense Minister Alexei Reznikov's stated long-term plan to retake Crimea without a fight. Carrying out such a plan would require cutting off Russian troops in Crimea from their supply lines via the Kerch Strait Bridge, ports like Sevastopol and the land route from the Russian city of Rostov-on-Don. JASMs could give Ukraine the ability to fire on and destroy logistic hubs like naval bases, ammunition depots, bridges, and command and control facilities deep within Crimea. It could also serve as an alternative to the surface-to-air ATAC-M's missile, which Ukraine has requested but not yet received. The United States has quite a few more JASMs than ATAC-M's, so it might be willing to supply them to augment Ukraine's current arsenal of storm shadows. Another area F-16s could be helpful to Ukraine is as a good old-fashioned deterrent. While Putin clearly has no desire for the war to end, he was recently forced to replace General Sergei Sorovkin due to his involvement in the Wagner Group's attempted coup against Putin himself. Sorovkin was widely known as one of Russia's most trigger-happy commanders, willing to launch indiscriminate attacks against the civilian population of Ukraine. But whoever he gets replaced with may be less gung-ho about ordering air and drone strikes on Kyiv especially if Ukraine has 200 F-16s with which to respond. While there's little chance that Russian attacks will stop in the east, Ukraine having advanced fighter jets may give it enough of an edge in the air that attacks in the west of the country are diminished. The fact that Ukrainian jets and helicopters have been forced to attack cautiously for the entire war means that F-16s and their longer-range weaponry could prove very useful here. 
Ukrainian pilots have developed a tactic of flying low, unleashing unguided rockets from Ukrainian territory, then immediately backing away to avoid anti-aircraft fire. Russian aircraft use similar tactics but have the advantage of superior firepower, which allows them to fire rockets and gliding bombs from a greater distance. A recent report from the Royal United Services Institute assessed that because of these tactics, even a small number of Western fighters could have a major deterrent effect. While F-16s likely will not grant Ukraine air superiority, they will make the defense of the country's airspace easier, and if paired with JASMs or similar weapons, provide an important means of launching the type of long-range weapons which are likely necessary to force Russia out of Crimea and other fortified areas. A group of Ukrainian parliament members speaking at the German Marshall Fund in Washington in April said they wanted the F-16 because its radar can locate targets on the ground hundreds of miles away, allowing pilots to stay safely over Ukrainian-held territory while launching weapons into Russian-occupied areas. In addition to defense and deterrence, this also suggests that F-16s could feature in the later stages of the counteroffensive currently underway, which could take the entire rest of the year. Colonel Yuri Inat, a spokesman for the Ukrainian Air Force, seemed to confirm this, telling the New York Times that F-16s could provide cover for Ukrainian troops trying to advance and hold formerly occupied areas. He noted that it could also be used to cut off Russian planes that have started launching guided missiles more than 30 miles from the Ukrainian front line, to defend the sea route that lets Ukrainian grain leave the country and to push further into the Russian-occupied oblasts. All of this helps explain why the Kremlin seems so nervous about the possibility of F-16s in Ukrainian hands. When it became clear that the US would greenlight their training and eventual transfer, Russian diplomats had a minor meltdown. First, Deputy Foreign Minister Sergei Rybakov said any transfer of the US jets to Ukraine would be pointless, since Russia's capabilities are more than enough to end the special military operation whenever they want. Now, by this point, we probably don't need to tell you that that's pure BS. When that was pointed out, Russian ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Antonov, went on to claim that even if the F-16s were transferred, they couldn't possibly be effective, since Ukraine lacks the proper infrastructure, pilots, and maintenance personnel. While this is slightly more true, given the country's incredible adaptability so far, there's no reason to think that Ukraine can't make F-16s work, given the right amount of time and training. The Kremlin knows this, and it seems to be making their threats increasingly desperate. When the statements by Antonov and Rybakov failed to scare NATO or the US, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov took the stage during a speech at a military conference in Tajikistan. He claimed that, we must keep in mind that one of the modifications of the F-16 can accommodate nuclear weapons. If they do not understand this, then they are worthless as military strategists and planners. This is obviously pretty ironic considering Russia's continual failures in military planning for the last year, but also shows a deep-seated worry from top officials. They likely don't think that the US would ever give Ukraine nuclear warheads, but know that even if F-16s do not change the battle space in the short term, they will bring Ukraine closer to the West and increase the country's military resilience. The West's response to these threats was also summed up pretty well in the reply to Lavrov by Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby that, if you're worried about Ukrainian military capabilities, then you should take your troops and leave Ukraine. This back and forth over F-16s highlights a larger trend in the war, that Ukraine's warfighting increasingly looks like that of the West, rather than a former Soviet satellite state. Because Russia failed so badly to understand the depth of Ukrainian resolve, Every step Putin and his cronies take pushes Ukraine towards NATO, the EU, and the US. By the end of the war, whenever that might come, Ukraine will have extremely close military, economic, and political ties to Europe and America. The F-16s are just the latest part of this broader shift, but the fact that their transfer has been approved is another sign that the Ukraine of 2021 is not the same as the one we see today. War has transformed the country into a major regional military power with advanced equipment and some of Europe's most battle-hardened troops. Even though Putin somehow hasn't learned his lesson yet, there's no doubt that Ukraine will play a major role in the future of European security. But what do you think? What does the transfer of F-16s to Ukraine mean for the future of the conflict? And will it be enough to overcome Russia's military? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis. Putin's invasion of Ukraine is a disaster, and it's no wonder. The man is a paranoid megalomaniac who goes around poisoning his opposition's underpants, uses outdated Soviet-era weapons and tactics on the battlefield, and isolates himself from the world to a degree that is clearly eating away at his sanity. 
And that's not all. If you haven't heard this before, we're here to talk about it today. Putin is a thief. While there are numerous military mistakes that Russian generals and armies have made, the mistakes begin at the top with Putin himself. No surprise there, right? But you may be surprised at just how fast and crazy this sea of mistakes, dirty little secrets and even just basic stupidity really is. Here's the scoop. You can tell how big a thief Vladimir Putin is by how many articles and documentaries have been made about how he's stolen Russia blind. One pertinent article is literally titled just that, Stealing Russia Blind. Written by Harley Balzer and published in the Journal of Democracy, in the article, Balzer points out that Putin has established the Systema, the Russian word for an established and accepted system, based on massive predation that has produced the most unequal wealth distribution in any developed economy. Estimates have suggested that Putin and his oligarch cronies have stolen more than a trillion dollars worth from the Russian economy since the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991. But that is just the beginning of Putin's kleptocracy story. Putin's experience with government-level theft started early, long before he reached Russia's throne, when he managed to steal $124 million worth of funding that was designed to feed the starving population of St. Petersburg in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union. In 1996, he was able to protect his boss, St. Petersburg Mayor Anatoly Sobchak, when Sobchak lost an election over a corruption scandal and fled the country, an escape arranged by Putin himself. That ability to protect his corrupt friends is what garnered attention by the equally corrupt Russian President Boris Yeltsin in 1999, who was leaving office during an investigation into his own massive corruption. Estimates by four different worldwide organizations of the level of endemic corruption in Russia suggested that at a minimum, $30 billion a year was being stolen from the Russian economy. That amounts to 10 to 12 percent of the national GDP. And that was just what the investigators could prove. Eventually, those losses cost his country dearly. Money that should have gone to train soldiers, to modernize equipment, to keep planes flying and tanks in working order, to simply fill up their gas tanks. All this had been stolen from Russia's military. That higher figure of $1 trillion worth of theft was mentioned again by investigator Bill Browder, who also suggested that Putin's net worth alone is in excess of $200 billion. These funds could have also gone to better roads, better healthcare, and better everything in Russia, not just a better military. But it's the kleptocracy rampant in Russia's military that the invasion of Ukraine has brought front and center. Russia has been undergoing a much vaunted modernization effort that's been ongoing since 2008. But these efforts have failed to root out Putin's personally embedded Sistema, which is present in all levels of Russia's military. The army's infantry commanders frequently inflate the number of active personnel in their units. And from the excess, those commanders steal the surplus funds for themselves. The accounting is continually plagued by falsified numbers of both men and material, which leads to false appraisal of the unit's true combat capability. But the units are not only plagued by missing soldiers and supplies, their lower-level commanders and sometimes the soldiers themselves have sold available gear and even their own vehicles gasoline for money or traded them for alcohol. All branches of the armed forces generally have unreliable and opaque reporting up and down the command chain, which has led Russia's leadership to believe its forces were better, quantitatively and qualitatively, than they really were at the start of the invasion. And with the lack of available gear for their newly mobilized troops, some soldiers or their families have had to resort to buying their own weapons, their own bulletproof gear, and sometimes even their uniforms. That's just… sad. And weird. And it's about to get weirder. Putin is personally responsible for the three segments that underpin his rule as an autocrat. He perpetuates his rule by maintaining absolute secrecy. He isolates himself from reality by listening to only a very select few advisors. And he surrounded himself with yes-men whose only redeeming quality is their unwavering loyalty. Since the beginning of the invasion in February of 2022, Moscow has, if anything, doubled down on silencing frank discussion of the conflict even going so far as to criminalize assessments of combat deaths and forecasts about how the war might unfold. Criticism of the war, it's still technically a crime to call Putin's special operation a war, though some media darlings have finally used that term, remains completely off-limits, including discussion of military incompetence and the absence of accountability that has led to the military's serious problems inside of Ukraine. This censorship makes it hard for the military elite to get accurate information on what's going wrong in the war, which in turn hampers their efforts to correct their mistakes. Meanwhile, the level of secrecy that Putin has made an intractable part of the Russian Sistema 
was one of the biggest reasons for the early failure of the invasion. The self-defeating deception caused by Putin's decision to prioritize operational secrecy and domestic blindness to the impending war led to a notable lack of adequate planning. Pre-invasion secrecy led to avoidable problems that specifically affected the initial application of Russian air power. Russian pilots had gained some experience fighting air battles in Syria, but operations there had taken place over mostly uncontested desert terrain where enemy opposition could be spotted and dealt with long before it became an actual threat. Russian pilots had almost no experience fighting over a forested country like Ukraine, a much more defensible and far larger area than the rebel-held enclaves in Syria. These pilots also hadn't trained against an opponent with any kind of layered air defenses and numerous manned portable air defense systems or man pads that Ukraine possessed. Russian pilots were given little to no training in such tactics before the invasion. That unpreparedness is partly why Russia has been unable to establish air superiority over the Ukrainian battlefield and why they've met with such heavy losses in the air. Another factor in the failure of the air assets was how Russia decided to employ their forces. Because their ground troops were in grave danger within days of the invasion, the Russian Air Force had its primary objective switched from suppressing air defenses to providing close air support, which in turn brought them into greater danger from the numerous Western-supplied manpad systems. These missions forced Russian pilots to engage targets at low altitudes which placed them well within the range of cheap and numerous anti-air missiles, like the US-made Stinger. After the first few months of this, Russia found itself not just suffering unacceptable losses of expensive aircraft and helicopters, but also significant drain of their trained pilots and aircrew, which take months or years worth of training to replace. And while all this is going on, Putin remains in his creepy little cave of isolation and delusions of grandeur. Not only is Putin's insistence on secrecy a major problem, but he has insulated himself from the reality of the world by relying on just a handful of advisors. By orchestrating the invasion with just a handful of military advisors, many of whom earned their positions not by being good strategists, but by being loyal to a fault, Putin created a plan that had no basis in reality. For example, the primary invasion thrust south from Belarus toward Kyiv brought only enough rations for the troops and fuel for their vehicles to last two to three days. The level to which Putin and his advisors were out of touch with reality was displayed by the troops who carried with them dress uniforms for their expected victory parade in the middle of the capital. Putin's invasion plan was filled with faulty assumptions, arbitrary political goals, and planning mistakes that ignored key Russian military principles. The initial invasion called for multiple unsupported lines of attack with no reserve forces tying the military to far-flung objectives that were unattainable for the modest size of its ground forces. Due to such isolation, Putin erroneously believed that his war plans were sound, that Ukraine would not put up much resistance, and that US and NATO support would not be strong enough or arrive fast enough to make a difference. The invasion plan reinforced in Putin's mind by his sycophantic comrades painted a picture of the valiant Russian army riding unchallenged into the territory of Ukraine. The brotherly Ukrainians would welcome them with open arms and would thank them for rescuing all of Ukraine from their neo-Nazi and corrupt drug-addicted leadership. The overmatched Ukrainian forces would run at the first sight of overwhelming Russian forces. After Kyiv fell within three days, the liberators would then receive a warm greeting in the southern and eastern regions of the country. The Russian elder brothers would then install a properly subservient government in Kyiv that would gratefully accommodate any demands Putin placed upon them. It came as quite a shock then when Russia's troops, which along with its direct leadership had no inkling that they were going to be an invading army, and ran headlong into a fierce and unified Ukrainian resistance supported by unexpected amounts of advanced Western weaponry and accurate satellite-supported intelligence. The three-pronged invasion suffered far more casualties than they either expected or could cope with. According to Russian doctrine, any major-level war such as the Ukraine invasion should have begun with weeks of air and missile attacks targeting an enemy's military installations and critical infrastructure. Russia's planners consider this the decisive period of warfare, with air force operations and missile strikes lasting between four and six weeks, designed to erode the opposing country's military capabilities and capacity to resist. According to Russia's military doctrine, ground forces are typically deployed to secure objectives only after massive artillery bombardments combined with air force and missile assaults have weakened or destroyed most of the opposition. But Putin's delusions aren't the only issue in the Ukraine war. When you have a leader who's lost touch with reality, 
and a whole crowd of people cheering all hail the emperor's new clothes, your kingdom is pretty much doomed. General George S. Patton used to say, if everybody is thinking alike then somebody isn't thinking. Patton was always keenly aware that yes men, those who only tell their bosses what the boss wants to hear, aren't helpful at all, but only reinforce what the boss is already thinking. In 2022, one of Putin's most significant intelligence figures defected to the West, carrying with him a trove of important information about Putin the man, detailing his habits, his fears, and his reluctance to use any cell phones. Gleb Karakulov, who served in the Federal Protection Service FSO, a quasi-military force tasked with protecting those officials closest to Putin, described Putin as a president who has lost touch with the world. Putin has been living in an information cocoon for the past couple of years, spending most of his time in his residences, which the media very fittingly calls bunkers. He is pathologically afraid for his life, he surrounds himself with an impenetrable barrier of quarantines and an information vacuum, he only values his own life and the lives of his family and friends. Karakulov also shed light on Putin's inner circle. Putin requires all staff working in the same room as him and anyone who will appear close to him in photo ops to undergo a two-week quarantine which severely limits the number of people who have personal access to him. Karakulov confirmed that Putin relies heavily for information on reports provided by the chiefs of his security services. Putin does not use a cell phone or the internet and does not even bring an internet specialist with him when he travels abroad. He only receives information from his closest circle, which means that he lives in an information vacuum, Karakulov said. Ok, so we've established Putin is pretty much running his own operation into the ground. But this isn't the only reason Russia is failing in the Russo-Ukraine war. Let's talk about Russia's abysmal logistics for a second. The famous quote, amateurs talk strategy, professionals talk logistics, has been credited to everyone from Napoleon to US General Omar Bradley. But the first recorded use of that phrase in that form was by a retired four-star marine general named Robert Hilliard Barrow. He was speaking about the difference between localized maneuvers that could win a battle and overall army supply coordination that could win or lose a war. Russia's invasion of Ukraine was plagued by logistical nightmares from the very beginning. Ukraine knew they could depend on their home-designed Skiff or Stuna P anti-tank guided missile ATGM systems, but they also knew they'd be facing 2,000 or more Russian main battle tanks, plus more than twice that number of armored infantry fighting vehicles IFVs. Knowing that Ukraine needed help against these armored forces, the US and its allies managed to deliver more than 17,000 anti-tank missile systems to Ukraine within the first month of the war, including the Anglo-Swedish short-range in-law rocket and the even more powerful US-made Javelin ATGM. Ukraine was also supplied with Bayraktar TB2 drones from Turkey. Ukraine used these weapon systems not just against Russia's armored forces, but also against even more valuable targets, their fuel and ammunition vehicles. Without resupplies of ammunition, their tanks and even their infantry had to resort to more limited attacks, and without fuel some of their armored columns ground to a halt completely. Most famous, the 40-mile-long armored column that struck south from Belarus toward Kyiv in the opening days of the war, was stalled due to a combination of stiff Ukrainian resistance, primarily ambushes from either side of the narrow penetration, combined with successful targeting of Russia's ammo and fuel trucks by both anti-tank missiles and targeted drone attacks. Military analysts who have analyzed the early months of the war have come to the conclusion that Russia completely botched its initial invasion for a variety of reasons and that its campaign has been riddled with miscalculations, poor communication, and widespread confusion. Former CIA military analyst Jeffrey Edmonds, who is also a Russia expert at the Center for Naval Analyses, says in a recent interview, We would have thought that they would have done a much more deliberate, well-thought-through operation. That is not what they did. Russian warfare usually involved masses of artillery pounding enemy locations, followed by massed armor and mechanized infantry assaults, combined with air support and helicopter attacks. Instead of leading with a substantial air and artillery campaign and gaining strategic superiority over Ukraine, Russian commanders apparently instructed their troops to just drive to Kyiv. The units quickly faced unexpected ambushes, repeated tactical surprise, and a logistic supply train that had not anticipated anything beyond a half-week offensive. The 40-mile traffic jam north of Kyiv underscored another recurring problem with Russian logistics. They are dependent on rail lines to move troops and support gear around their own country, but cannot link those rail lines up with their offensive advances into Ukraine. 
That leaves a gap between Russia's end-of-the-line ammo and fuel dumps and the Ukrainian front lines. One solution Russian commanders used to reduce that gap, and the length of time it would take to resupply forward units, was placing their supply dumps closer to the front lines. That decision turned disastrous when the US began providing Ukraine with better artillery systems, including the M142 High Mobility Artillery Rocket System, or HIMARS, with its pinpoint accuracy out to 50 miles, twice the range of the M777 howitzer Ukraine had previously been using with its 25-mile range. But Russian commanders failed to respect the accuracy and range of HIMARS systems and continually lost weapon storage depots over and over again. Too often, Russia placed their ammunition in the same building as their troops or close by to such a location. That proved disastrous on at least one occasion, when Ukraine struck an occupied school building in Makiivka in the Donetsk region on New Year's Eve, killing as many as 400 Russian soldiers and wounding another 300, according to Ukraine claims. Another persistent problem in Russia's logistics fiasco has been the reliance on unsecured phone lines. This has allowed Ukrainian intelligence to triangulate their position and strike them with highly accurate artillery and missile strikes. One such attack reportedly left hundreds of Russian soldiers dead and prompted the Russian Ministry of Defense to announce it is already clear that the main reason of what took place included the massive use, contrary to the ban, of personal mobile phones in the range of enemy weapons. Yet such use persists, both from the average trooper to the high command. The Russian news agency TASS suggested that the New Year's Eve attack was also due to soldiers' misuse of civilian cell phones. Preliminarily, the reason for the strike was the active use of mobile phones by the newly arrived military personnel. The enemy revealed the activity of cellular communications and the location of the subscribers, which allowed them to target the temporary barracks. And then there's Russia's mass misjudgment of NATO's united front. Putin and his tiny handful of advisors also miscalculated the stiffness of NATO's resolve to defend Ukraine, as well as their willingness to arm them with every weapon system they could. Putin believed the individual countries of NATO, led by the US, Germany, France, Great Britain, and Poland, would each go their separate ways and would fail to provide a united front against what Putin expected would be a short blitzkrieg-type war. Instead, his brutal invasion solidified NATO's unity and even helped convince new countries like Finland and Sweden to ask for membership. Finland's admission, making NATO's 31st member, was an especially bitter pill to swallow, as it increased NATO's border presence with Russia by an extra 830 miles. This was clearly one of Putin's most significant blunders. The US, NATO, and the European Union have remained relatively united in providing billions of military aid to Ukraine, as well as considerable humanitarian assistance while simultaneously applying sweeping sanctions against Russia. The sanctions have crippled the Russian economy, which took an extra hit from the loss of between 700,000 and 1 million young Russians who fled the country ahead of Putin's draft in the fall of 2022. The Russian population pyramid, already in an upside-down position with a declining birth rate and far more older citizens than young ones to replace them, is now teetering like a half-chopped-down tree, ready to collapse at any moment. Now, let's get into the truly ridiculous part of our analysis of Putin's failures as a war commander, fighting a modern war using World War I tactics. By the end of the first year of the war, it became clear that in addition to all the strategic and leadership mistakes Putin and Russia have committed, there's a vast difference in how the two armies are fighting it out on the ground. While Ukraine has relied heavily on smart weapons, surveillance and attack drones, ATGMs, man pads, precision guided munitions, even drone attack boats in the Black Sea, Russia has settled on the World War I tactic of massed artillery, followed by human waves of soldiers, often without even the benefit of a few tanks sprinkled in here and there for support. Such tactics may have worked in World War I, or even the latter stages of World War II, when the former Soviet Union had more than a million men under arms, and was facing a severely weakened German army that had bled white from four years of continuous warfare. But Ukraine has learned to adapt and overcome, and has used its precision artillery systems, especially the HIMARS artillery, to telling effect. Meanwhile, Russia has used their huge surplus of artillery to flatten cities like Bakhmut, Mariinka, and Mariupol. But the massed infantry assaults that followed leveled a horrific toll on the attackers. Estimates are that in addition to losing more than half of their pre-war stockpile of main battle tanks, Russia has lost more than 200,000 soldiers killed, wounded, or captured. Their losses in the 10-month effort to take Bakhmut 
have been so enormous that the Wagner private mercenary group that spearheaded the 10-month battle had to pull out of the line of combat to refit, retrain, and regroup. Some estimates say that Wagner may have lost 90% of their 80,000-man full strength. Wagner's leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, will only admit to having lost 20,000 men, which is still a staggeringly high number of casualties for a city that has no inherent strategic value. While we're on the subject of losses, let's talk about the real crime and tragedy of this war. Because of the sanctions limiting Russia's access to computer chips and other resources for their high-tech industries, Russia has been unable to replace many of their advanced weapons, such as their precision munitions and state-of-the-art missiles. That's why analysts are stunned to see Putin wasting so much of its stockpiles of precision munitions on striking civilian targets. Military experts and government officials have said that Putin's terror campaign against the Ukrainian population was not a sustainable use of Russia's limited stockpiles and was unlikely to negatively affect Ukraine's will to fight. In fact, just the opposite has happened. Continued explosions in civilian areas across Ukraine, not just the capital of Kyiv, have hardened the average Ukrainian's resolve to see this fight through until every Russian soldier has been pushed out of their country. More recently, senior U.S. intelligence officials have said Russia is burning through its munitions faster than it can replace them. Officials also say the use of massive amounts of artillery and precision-guided munitions has forced Moscow to turn to Iran and North Korea for supplies. Retired U.S. Army General David Petraeus summed up just a few of the mistakes Putin has made during his invasion of Ukraine when he said, They completely underestimated the Ukrainian forces and completely overestimated the Russian forces, and they could not impose their line of conducting a military campaign and prepare forces for conducting this campaign. In addition, they did not have modern telecommunication systems, he said, referring to their use of civilian cell phones. Therefore, the generals continued to die, commanding an army from within an intelligence vacuum, relying on sycophants and toadies rather than experts and veterans. An army sent to war without proper planning, hamstrung by poor logistics, and saddled with rampant thievery, underestimating your opponent's will to fight, misjudging NATO's united front, squandering sophisticated precision weapons on a campaign to try to break the will of a large civilian population, youth movement to leave the country possibly for good, an economy that has been wrecked by sanctions that continue to penalize the ones who are still left day after day. It seems like Putin not only did not follow Sun Tzu's dictum to win your battles by making no mistakes, it seems like he's made practically every mistake in the book. But what do you think? What is Putin's greatest mistake in the war in Ukraine? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. If you've been watching the news recently, it's no secret that things aren't going well for Russian President Vladimir Putin. In fact, according to former CIA Chief of Russian Operations Steve Hall, Putin's troubles are mounting at breakneck speed, and they might just be enough to break the infamous dictator. In this video, let's take a look at some of Hall's predictions about what might happen in Ukraine and just how much trouble Russia and its leader are really in. To start with, let's consider firepower. It's hard to turn on a TV without seeing something about Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky asking for more ammunition. For instance, there have been multiple high-profile stories about how Ukraine's air defenses are short on missiles, leading some to speculate that Russia's air force would finally gain control of the skies and crush Ukrainian resistance. But the truth was far less ominous. Ukrainians had simply stated that at the current burn rate of ammunition, they might run out in a few months, not right away. In much the same way, there have been multiple stories on Ukraine facing shortages of shells for its artillery and other systems like the HIMARS rockets. But what these reports don't capture is that Russia is having the same type of problems, just on a far larger scale. Russian ammunition shortages have become just as severe as those on the Ukrainian side. But unlike Ukraine, Russia does not have the same huge coalition of powerful and well-armed Western allies willing to send it more materiel. Instead, its allies are limited to Iran, Belarus and, reportedly, South Africa, China and a few others. To date, the main advantage Russia has had over Ukraine comes from its Soviet legacy. Modern Russia contains massive stockpiles of Soviet weaponry and equipment, left over from the enormous arms buildups of the Cold War. However, after more than a year of war in Ukraine, that stockpile is closer than ever to being depleted. 
One sign of this came several months ago, when Ukraine announced that for the first time, it had achieved artillery parity with Russia. Throughout most of the conflict, Russia had fired more than 20 times the shells of Ukraine, but for the first time, they began firing the same volume of shells, substantially leveling the playing field. This was aided by HIMARS strikes and sabotage of ammunition depots far behind Russian lines, so that by early to mid-2023, Ukraine was outfiring Russia 6 to 1. As Hall has noted, I think the pattern that we've seen over this year, the first year of the Ukrainian war, has been the West very slowly, very cautiously. I think probably not to overwhelm Ukrainian logistics capabilities, ramping up the type of weaponry and ammunition that goes with that. The huge shift in firepower had a noticeable effect on Russia's attempted offensive operations. Due to the poor training, planning, and leadership of Russian ground troops, most of their operations during the war have been heavily reliant on huge artillery barrages. But once their overwhelming artillery superiority went away, it's probably unsurprising that Russian infantry and tank forces haven't fared very well. This is somewhat expected from a military made up of mainly green and poorly trained conscripts, where most of the professional soldiers are more interested in lining their own pockets than defending a homeland. Most of Russia's actual territorial gains since the start of the invasion last year have been achieved by the Wagner Group, a huge private military contractor run by close Putin confidant Yevgeny Prigozhin. Unlike most of the Russian armed forces, the Wagner Group is well-trained and equipped, allowing them to avoid some of the most basic pitfalls like walking into endless ambushes or fighting with no boots. One of the Wagner Group's most successful, yet horrible strategies has been the use of prisoners from Russian detention centers and jails, promising them freedom if they can survive a tour fighting in Ukraine. Leaked documents and phone calls suggest that Prigozhin and Putin never had any intention of letting most of these prisoners back into Russian society. Instead, tactics show that they have used them over and over again in the so-called human wave attacks, which helped Russia retake the devastated city of Bakhmut. Wagner released thousands of these armed prisoners who threw themselves against Ukrainian positions and risked being shot by other Russian troops if they retreated. When the Ukrainians opened their lines and revealed their primary defenses, Wagner's regular units would then begin direct assaults on the weakest points, often expending huge amounts of artillery. This strategy proved to be highly effective, especially for a military with such little emphasis on preserving the lives of its own troops. In Bakhmut and several other locations, Ukraine was eventually pushed back due to this strategy, which resembled Russia's actions during the huge sieges of World War II. But Wagner remains not just reliant on prisoners, but also on the continual influx of supplies from Russia's defense ministry. While the group has purchased a substantial amount of its own equipment over the years, inside Ukraine it has proved to be heavily reliant on Russian resupply to keep up the pressure on Ukraine. This has proved to be a significant weakness, and it could also mean the loss of Bakhmut, and more valuable territory during the Ukrainian counteroffensive taking place this summer. Much of the issue has to do with the way that Russia, and Putin in particular, go about politics. One thing Hall has pointed out is that to keep his firm hold on power, Putin must ensure that none of his direct subordinates are too successful, or run the risk of being overthrown. To do so, he often sets elements of his own government against each other, with advisors and senior military planners competing, often viciously. This applies to Prigozhin too. The man sometimes known as Putin's chef experienced a meteoric rise to his current position. Despite private military contractors technically being against Russian law, Putin allowed Prigozhin to create Wagner, on the condition that the group be firmly loyal to Putin, not the Russian state. This formed the basis for Wagner's various interventions in Africa and the Middle East, where it expanded Putin's military reach enriched Russian business interests and left a trail of atrocities in its wake. Wagner's success launched Prigozhin into Putin's inner circle. This has not gone over well with other top Russian officials, such as Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. Shoigu seems to believe that Prigozhin's ambitions and control over a private military are setting him up as the next head of the Russian military, or as Putin's personal successor. He may have reason to worry about his own job too, as Russia's military prowess under him has been less than stellar. Due to its enormous losses, the country is actually the number one supplier of materiel to Ukraine, having abandoned roughly 500 since the start of its invasion. It has also lost advanced air defense systems and huge amounts of ammo. All this is a very bad look for Shoigu, and has led some to speculate about the reasons why Putin has dismissed multiple of his other top generals but not Shoigu himself. 
One answer is that he has kept Shoigu in charge of the military because without Putin's support, Shoigu is a goner and he knows it. And like the politically adept Prigozhin, Shoigu is an outsider to the corrupt ladder of Russian politics, having come up through the ranks from essentially nothing. Shoigu thus has few friends in Russia's top echelons and does not pose a real risk to Putin's power and control of the state. Ironically, his rise was also as a logistics officer, where he was able to skim or divert large amounts of money from defense projects. Some US military officials have even referred to him as responsible for dismantling much of Russia's capabilities. Prigozhin has also repeatedly attacked Shoigu for his failures in Ukraine, while at the same time pointing out that Wagner has achieved what he could not in places like Bakhmut. It would be easy for Putin to replace the somewhat unpopular Shoigu with Prigozhin, but doing so would potentially endanger Putin himself. Shoigu has also tried to push back from his position atop the Russian military command. He took credit for the capture of Solodar, a salt mining town which Wagner actually seems to have done most of the fighting for. Prigozhin actually took to social media to refute these claims and bash Shoigu. And just as Wagner was about to capture Bakhmut, it happened again. As Wagner troops were only miles from retaking the last of the town, Shoigu pulled their supplies just to hurt his rival. Now Russia's issues with supplies have compromised its entire war effort and become a masterclass in how not to handle logistics. In response to Shoigu's actions in Bakhmut, Prigozhin took to social media once again, threatening to pull Wagner troops out of the area entirely, leaving the ineffective Russian military on its own. Obviously, this would have been a disaster and made Ukraine's counter-offensive that much easier. Shoigu, of course, claimed that he was not manipulating supply lines and that Wagner had actually received everything it had been promised. When Prigozhin took a stand and declared that he would pull out all Wagner troops from Bakhmut by May 10th, the supplies miraculously started flowing again, only to be reduced just days later. So is this just a petty personal struggle, or are Russia's supply issues really that bad? Well, it appears that things may actually be that disastrous, with personal rivalries like this being just one factor among many. While Russia's artillery and other heavy guns were firing almost non-stop last year, now they sit inactive for days at a time. This has allowed Ukrainian forces more opportunity to respond, and may be one reason why the counter-offensive began now. In Bakhmut, recent reports suggest that Ukraine is now advancing south of the city, along a salient about four miles deep, pushing Russian forces back. In part, this is possible thanks to the issues between Shoigu and Prigozhin, and due to the fact that Wagner has been doing the brunt of the fighting, while Russian troops secure its flanks. These flanking troops have been attempting to cut off the city for months by capturing the main supply routes to Ukrainian positions. As Wagner closed in on the city and Ukrainian defenders were pushed back, the flank attacks have increased in frequency and intensity. Even as Wagner troops reportedly ran out of ammunition, it seemed as though Shoigu was content to let them take the losses, while using his troops to secure the area. Ukraine has not given up easily though. It reinforced defenders around Bakhmut with special forces, who managed to grind the Spring Russian Offensive to a halt. Since Wagner was unable to launch major attacks against Ukraine from the center, it has allowed Ukrainian forces to reinforce their flanks and launch the deadly counterattacks, which continue today. Prigozhin has once again complained about all this on social media, and his outbursts are nearly intense enough to constitute treason against the state. He has claimed that regular Russian forces broke and ran at the first hint of a Ukrainian attack, blaming Shoigu for the current situation. But from Ukrainian sources on the ground, it appears as though many of the troops cutting and running may actually be Wagner units. Such reports seem to have angered Prigozhin enough that he has actually lashed out at Putin online, in ways which could be very bad for his health. In a recent broadcast following more losses at Bakhmut, he stated that the happy grandfather thinks that he is good. If he turns out to be right, then God may grant everyone health. But what will the country do, our children, grandchildren, who are the future of Russia? And how can we win this war if, by chance, it turns out that this grandfather is a complete shithead? Putin is frequently referred to as Russia's grandfather, and Prigozhin seems to be directly attacking him in a way that no other Russian official has dared to do. Prigozhin quickly walked back his attack in later interviews, careful to state that many in Russian leadership could be called grandfather but most likely the lashing out was a sign that Prigozhin is increasingly frustrated with the state of the war effort and blames Putin for the untenable situation. This is also likely to be one of the biggest issues Putin has yet faced, with his two top military leaders essentially sabotaging each other. The Russian offensive in Bakhmut has not been nearly as successful as it should have been. 
Just as Russia started to make headway against Ukraine, the supply issues and infighting may have doomed them once again. What's more, the actual prospect of victory in Bakhmut is essentially meaningless, as the city has never held any real strategic significance. Its only true value is political and ideological, as Putin sees Bakhmut as a symbol of his invasion's success, and losing it would undermine Russian support for the war effort. And Bakhmut is just one piece of the larger picture. This type of drama is playing out across the battle space in Ukraine, as different factions of the Russian military compete against each other for plunder and political influence. But we should remember that at least some of this insanity is by Putin's design, intended to make sure that no one faction can challenge him for dominance in Russia. And while hundreds of thousands of ordinary Russians have paid with their lives, the constant violence in Ukraine still seems far from the gilded halls of the Kremlin and Putin's vacation palaces. Even so, Putin knows that he has risked a lot in this conflict. As Hall points out, as to whether or not Putin will run out of something – willpower, ammunition, men – that he wants to send into the meat grinder, I would be surprised if Putin were to just say, OK, no, this is a big mistake, or I've gone too far, or we don't have enough resources. This is one of the significant problems with this, is where does Putin go from here? If he somehow gives up and surrenders, that's going to have negative implications for him back in Russia. But if he doesn't win, that will too, and it looks like he's not going to win. I'm glad I'm not in Vladimir Putin's position right now because he doesn't have a whole lot of space to work with. And in this latest stage of the war, Putin's troubles are increasing again. This time not even due to the incompetence of his own forces. The issue has to do with Ukraine's increasing access to long-range precision weaponry. Since the beginning of the conflict, Kyiv has been asking the West for more materiel, but they have been slow to materialize. It took months for the HIMARS missile system to be delivered. But once it was, Ukraine gained the ability to strike static targets several dozen miles away with deadly accuracy. And in the time since, the West seems to have become more receptive to handing over increasingly powerful weaponry. One of these is the Army Tactical Missile System, or ATAC-Ms, capable of striking targets up to 190 miles away. If the US decides to give these or other similarly capable weapons to the Ukrainians, it will put many major Russian cities and military installations within striking distance. Similarly, the United Kingdom recently agreed to provide Kyiv with the Storm Shadow cruise missile. With sophisticated stealth capabilities and a range more than twice that of the HIMARS, the Storm Shadow will allow Ukraine to hit targets far behind enemy lines as the counteroffensive ramps up. UK Defense Secretary Ben Wallace confirmed that some of these weapons are already in-country, meaning we will likely start to see their effects soon. The UK has over 900 Storm Shadows in its arsenal, meaning that a sizable number will arrive this summer. While Ukraine's government has vowed not to strike into Russia itself, there are signs that it already is using drone attacks and border incursions. It is a simple reality that Ukraine cannot win the war without destroying at least the Russian bases resupplying the front, and this will almost certainly require strikes inside Russia proper. The same may hold true for F-16s, and other advanced fighter jets. As Hall has stated, remember a few months ago when they said, we're not going to send tanks, so that has shifted. Will this be another thing that shifts? Perhaps some of it will depend on what happens on the ground in the next year. A final element of the war's trajectory is the possibility of more external intervention, some of which might favor Russia. If Ukraine continues striking deeply into Russian territory, some experts have argued that China may soon get involved. Putin and Chinese President Xi Jinping remain tacit allies, and China would not like the idea that a smaller neighbor supplied by the West could strike inside its borders. This and the CCP's affinity for fellow authoritarian regimes makes their position something of a question mark. As Hall notes, you know, the Chinese position is really interesting and very complicated. The Chinese have very long-term goals. They want to be the primary superpower economically and militarily within the next 50 years. But by the same token, they share a certain ideology with Russia, and that is that democracies are a threat to them. So how is China going to play a neutral, moderating position in this when it's pretty clear they're coming down on Russia's side? Clearly that helps Russia, so China is walking a really fine tightrope at this point. However, there is also the possibility that China will attempt to stay in Ukraine's good graces in order to offer economic assistance rebuilding the country through loans and development projects. This is the strategy that Xi has taken with his massive Belt and Road project, and if applied to Ukraine, could generate substantial leverage over the West. 
Hall argues that if China wants a future, it's going to have to have really good economic relations with the West, the EU, the United States, and other developed countries. And a relationship with Russia is mutually exclusive, so if I'm Russia, I'm probably thinking that over the long term, the Chinese are not necessarily going to be on our side. All these considerations will play into how the war changes course in the months ahead. Russia's disorganization under Putin, Ukraine's increasing military assistance from the West, and the potential for more external involvement will all shape how effective the Ukrainian counteroffensive is this summer. They will also determine the long-term prospects for peace, as any potential peace treaty will not emerge until one side is definitively crippled, or forced to make concessions by its citizens or allied nations. When the dust finally settles, one thing is clear. Russia and Ukraine will both be changed forever, all due to the greed and ambition of one man, Vladimir Putin. So will Hall's prediction for the war pan out, or will there be another major deciding factor in how things go this summer and beyond? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more military content and analysis.